now let's get that going and I am going to share this all right today we are going to be covering where it starts getting into the actual accounting and paperwork again like I said I've been avoiding this a little bit because I didn't want you guys to get start getting this confused so that it starts to interfere with your individual side so but we have to start getting into that now, so let's get going with it. Um, the business accounting side is not different. Again, like I said, remember when we compared business entities to the individual side, we looked and we said, hey, it's got a mom and a dad, it's got a birthday, it's got, you know, <laughs> it's all the same, okay? Most of it holds true even with business accounting, okay? There's not that much, I mean, there are differences, and some of them are big, but most of them still hold true on the business side. Because remember, they were created to just be an outside entity so that they could duplicate what um, a person did, just handled with different laws. All right. So with the business entity, they have their own set. Uh, a lot of the forms are the same, but they just have each one its own set of forms. So... What we're going to do is go over the specific business accounting itself. So let's start with some of the basic forms. All right. So that's what we're going to do here is we're going to cover the business forms, the reporting, and what the employees are and how those are reported. All right. Start. The forms, most of them are are the actual employee reporting forms, income reporting forms. And there's one important form on here that's an important one for business versus personal, and that's the 8300 form. Um, it's important because it came about mainly because of 9-11, and it is now probably one of the most enforced forms there is. As a matter of fact, it's they pretty much created an entire specific agency because of that form. So, and we'll go into that, and actually that's one of the first things we're going to be covering. Um, when 9-11 happened, and this is one that is, that this, this is on the test, and they do cover this in, de in detail because it is probably the major difference between a business and an individual. Because an individual can do this transaction, and it doesn't count. But if a business does this transaction, you have to file this form, period. If I go and I have a car I'm selling and I'm selling my car for 15,000 bucks, Bob down the street wants to buy my car and he's been saving up mowing yards or whatever and selling baseball cards, who knows what. And he's got 15 grand. He walks up to me and he has me $15,000. He bought my car. He got a traveler's check or cashier's check. He has me fifteen thousand dollars. It transfers me uh, even a you know cashier's check for fifteen thousand dollars. He goes to his grandparents. Who knows? Gets traveler's checks for fifteen thousand dollars. Do I have to report that? Yes. Yes. No, not fifteen thousand. Thank you, Garrett. No, I don't have to report that for $15,000, but it has nothing to do with the amount. It has to do with the fact that I'm a person. The reason I say that is individuals are not required to report the transactions. So let's go into this. This is called a large currency transaction report. All right, and I'm going to give you some of the history on it and some of the guidelines for it. And like I said, it is literally the most enforced form there is because of what it is and how it's used and what, it, what the, why it came about. Okay, now, it's very important you understand what this means. It is $10,000 in a single business day. That's important it's, that it's noted that it's a single business day not a single transaction. Okay. It is not a single transaction. It is a single business day. 
Now, again, like I said, I'm going to just give you these guidelines and then we'll go into them. Now, that can be any kind of currency. Currency, now currency, I mean cash, traveler's checks, cashier's checks, wire transfers, anything that's an instant form of transfer. Okay, checks are not considered an instant, instant form of transfer. They are not cash going from one location to another. Um, one of the other things that's actually starting to become an issue, can you guess what it is? Marijuana. <laughs> Marijuana, that is one. Yeah. You know, the sales because it's all cash. Yep, all cash, but there's one other that's even bigger than that. Any idea what it is? Can and actually... Know? Huh? No, casinos is, is reportable. Yeah, the casino is reportable, but here it's a type of cash. When we're talking about this, we're talking about type of currency. Type of currency. Thank Bitcoin. you. Got it right there, Lisa. What is happening is Bitcoin, <laughs> cryptocurrency, is also instant money. It's not. It's like the same thing as holding, and you can hold a whole lot of money in your pocket with cryptocurrency. And it is pretty much untrackable. It is pretty much instantly transferred. And there is almost no way to track it. Okay. And so when we talk about this, it's the same thing as holding cash almost. And so to regulate it and to keep track of it is really hard um, because of this issue. So when we do this, and again, we're going to get into the history of this one because this one's really important. Any type of instant cash, and marijuana is, by the way, considered a form of currency in a sense now. The reason I say this, and there's also, now here's, now this is strange because we don't actually, <sighs> there is one other type and it's one other type that we don't actually look at, but we do have to report. And most people don't consider it because it doesn't happen that often. And it's actually not, in a sense, on the exam. What is another type of currency? And it falls into the marijuana category, in a sense. What do you care, can you carry in your pocket that has a whole lot of value? Cell phone. <laughs> no, much, much more valuable than that. Oh, Credit card. They can be, they, no, they can be exchanged as currency. I have no idea. What did they used to use as money? Gold. Thank you. There you go. Um, did you know that in Dubai, there is actually an ATM that will pay you in gold bars. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I gotta go see that. <laughs> um, you go in there and you can literally buy gold bars gold directly rate. from the ATM. Now, most of us forget that for most of the country's life, that has actually been a form of exchange. And it counts for a lot of places. And, you know, you say, you know, it says literally we'll buy gold, silver, you know, that sort of thing. Gold and silver and platinum are considered a form of exchange. And gold especially. And you walk into any pawn shop, any, any place, and you can exchange it ex ex straight value, straight across for gold, uh, for, for cash. And most people will treat it as a form of currency. And if you get really extremes, there are two other ones, but they are so extreme that they don't happen for, they don't get tracked in that sense, but that's also high-end ones is art and diamonds. Mm -hmm. They actually have to be transacted, like you go to Sotheby's and where they're um, selling those high-end pictures and the high-end paintings and you see that the Mona Lisa sold for $50 million today or whatever it may be. 
um, those are considered high-end transactions as well. Luckily, when they get bought and sold, they're not necessarily, um, their record of transfer is pretty well documented. But there are a lot of times, you know, gold has no inherent shape unless you're selling like the Hope Diamond you know, or something where it's specifically in a gold setting or something like that, where it's identifiable, you can have literally a gold bar and it's currency. Now, most places, they'll look at you really strange, but I guarantee you, if you walk into uh, some stores and you hand, hand them a gold bar, I guarantee you they're going to pay attention. They may think you're insane, but you'll probably walk out with stuff if you have gold with you. Well, you can buy groceries at Freddy's with uh, Golden Eagles. There you go. So, I mean, they do. And, and here's, oh, here's the best part. Now, most people do not know this as well. There was actually a case. Now, here, here's what's really cool. Um, there was a case where a company, this is a high-end investment company, and it had to go to court because what they did was they actually paid their employees in gold coins. Now, what is the value of a $20 gold coin? $20. $20. <laughs> what is the actual value of a $20 gold coin? <laughs> it's usually, I think, one troy ounce or I can't remember. Yes, yeah, one troy ounce of gold. $1,017. Some, something like that, yeah. I don't know what the exchange rate is today. So, What's its actual value to the what's its value to the IRS technically? One thousand seventeen dollars. No, that was the problem. It's not. To the IRS technically it has to be considered. It could because it's stamped as a twenty dollar coin, guess what its value has to be considered to the IRS? Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. It's a twenty dollar form of, of ten of currency. So when they pay their employees in that twenty dollar coin. Guess what they get taxed on? You know what their income is? Not much. $20. Do you know what the tax is on $20 versus 17, uh, what, 1017 And give them a stack of those things, you know? Quite a bit less. Quite a bit less. But I actually had to go to court to prove it. But in the end, they won because that is actually a form of currency. So even though it's a gold coin and worth a whole lot more as a gold coin... It's still a $20 coin. You know, it's kind of like the Silver Eagles. Silver Eagles are 35 bucks or whatever you can get for them. They're really nice Liberty <sighs> Silver Eagles, wherever they are. Still only a dollar or, you know, so. So uh, you have to pay attention to it that way as well. But those, even though they have a value as a metal, they also have a currency value. So think about this. If you are a smuggler, a terrorist, a drug smuggler, a drug dealer, how would you exchange your money? How would you transfer your money? I got a whole lot of money I need to get across the border or whatever. Isn't it a whole lot easier to carry a bunch of money as gold or something which high value on the other side that I can sell? Or <laughs> If I want a thousand dollars in I want to carry across. Do I want to carry one gold coin or do I want to carry a thousand dollars in cash? So gold coin. one gold coin is a whole lot easier to carry, isn't it? When immigrants so, were immigrating from Poland and Russia, the women would sew, sew gold coins into their skirts. Exactly. So let's come up, uh, let's come up to modern day. I'm a terrorist. I need to move money in and out of the country. I need to support my terrorist activities. Be careful. This is being recorded, Ryan. <laughs> yes. No. I'm saying by example. Okay. For example, we're trying to move currency in and out of a country. They would hide it as a transaction. Okay. They would try to hide it by buying and selling something of large value move it over into the country and then sell it off here. Yeah. Okay. So if I take it and I buy a diamond over here, 
move it over here and sell it off currency just exchange hands well that currency transaction where you're buying or selling something of large value in a single day now that's important again is the most important part the single day okay so I'm actually a drug dealer if you go out there and I'm selling drugs what happens is I have a whole lot of cash in my hands I need to try to make that money legitimate <laughs> This is the money laundering side. You need to clean that money, hence the word money laundering. Launder, you, need, yeah. you need to launder that money. You need to make it legitimate. Okay. So what you need to do is pay for things with it or use it in some way with a business so that it can actually show a business transaction. So what you do is you can't just, I mean, it gets noticed when you walk into a bank with an entire suitcase full of money. Okay, if you walk in with, you know, $100,000 in cash and set it down on the counter, somebody might notice. Okay, I used to work in a bank when I was, when I was in college, and I handled commercial transactions, and we handled when the, you know, the gas stations or whatnot, especially in Chicago, would have, you know, $50,000, $100,000 in cash from the weekend's holiday, especially the long holiday weekend when the bank was closed, you'd have three days worth, worth of currency more or less there. <laughs> And they would bring that in and they would have fifty to $100,000 in cash. They would walk in literally with a bag of currency. And it would be set there. We have to count through it. It got noticed and it got recorded. Um, to walk in there, if you were a drug dealer doing so, it gets noticed. Well, the problem is let's say you were a terrorist organization, you were trying to get this money so it looked legitimate so you could use it for your terrorist activities. If you walk into a bank with a large amount of currency, it gets noticed. So they had to try to find ways to hide it. So what they would do is they would walk in and do them in little transactions. Bob would walk in in the morning, do 5,000, whatever, walk out, in the afternoon, he'd come back in, deposit another 2000 you know, leave, come back, another 3000 leave, come back, another, you know, 1000 Okay, it adds up. Well, that's why it says in a single business day. Um, we think about it, if you walk in with one great big bag, well, he just walked in four times, and the total was over $10,000 for his four times. That's why it's within a single business day. The same holds true at the casino. Think about this. You walk into the casino and you sit down and you buy, again, you're a drug dealer or you're a uh, terrorist and you need to clean that money. You sit down at a table at a casino and this is why the casinos really have are held responsible for reporting it. Casinos exchange cash literally at that table for chips, okay? Then those chips are considered valid currency for inside that casino at the cage. The cages then give you currency back. Now, what happens? I'm sitting there and I buy $5,000 worth of chips, okay? I play for a little bit, and I take that $5,000 for the chips, and I go over to another table, and I play for a little bit. Now I got maybe $4,500, $4,800 worth of chips left. I stand up, I walk over to the cage, and I cash in that $4,800 for the chips. What do I have now? $4,800. $4,800 in legitimate cash. Legitimate cash now. Okay, because there's actually cameras recording me showing that I have $4,800 in cash. It came right out of the casino. Okay, now I walk away with it. Now I come back a few hours later, lay down $3,000 in cash. Okay, I get $3,000 in chips, play for a little bit, walk back over the cage. I now have $3,000 or whatever I had, $2,700 left, or maybe I won a little bit, now I got $3,200 or whatever. I take it back from the cage. Now you're talking, I've got 7000 probably close to $8,000, whatever, in legitimate cash. Because I can show that I got this from winnings at the casino. 
you know, I just was at the casino. I didn't, you know. And there are surveillance cameras which show that I got it, and I can show that I exchanged chips at the casino because there's a record of it. Okay? That's why the casinos are really held to report any transaction. They are actually held to any transaction over $2,000. They actually have to log. It's not, it's not reported, but they have to log any transaction over $2,000 has to go into what's called a large uh, currency transaction log. And it goes in there saying, this person was here with over $2,000 because throughout the day, they will come and go and do exactly what I just said, launder money. You stick money into a, here's, here's the best one. I am playing the slot machine. How much money can you put into a slot machine? You can put any amount. You can cram thousands of dollars into a slot machine. And what do you get from a slot machine? If I hit cash out, thank you, you get the little ticket. What is that little ticket? Cash. Proof of money. Proof of legitimacy. Guess what? That's your winnings. If you go click with your cell phone, do you now have a receipt showing winnings from the casino? Yes. Thank you. You now have a receipt showing you just had winnings at the casino. Because it's even a printout. It comes out of that cash out slot machine and you just shoved $5,000 into it. $5,000 just came right back out. Guess what? That is a laundry mat. You go in there, you shove 5000 in, it gets 5000 right back out, and it even shows you the receipt. And you take a picture of it, and that's all cleaned money. So what happened was, years ago, before 9-11, it was pretty easy to do that. Okay, You don't think about money laundering and this, but I've actually gone to workshops on this, especially when you have a wife who actually has to do this daily and report to the IRS about it because of the the fact she works for the casino. Um, they have to literally track this for every single person in the casino. And that when you don't have, remember, it doesn't track your name or anything on those things unless you actually put that player's, that's, most people don't realize that player's card that you use has two purposes. That player's card makes it really neat for you to put it in there and get the points and all that. It serves a second purpose. And that's to associate that player and all of its information with that winning ticket. Because in the end, that's how they track a lot of the money flow. The computers do it automatically. Um, because before 9-11, it was pretty free. You know, you've seen those, those movies like Scarface. Scarface is probably one of the best examples. Scarface is the Al, uh, uh, Al Pacino movie where he's uh, uh, from Cuba. He was one of the guys who came over to Florida. And he hello, started a drug dealer. Friend. There you go. Hello, my <laughs> Say hello to my little friend. And he is a drug dealer, and they show scenes where he's literally walk. He and his guys are walking into the bank. Each one are carrying suitcases in each hand. All right, literally suitcases, luggage, suitcases, stuffed with cash. Okay, and there's a line of their guys. We're talking six or seven guys walking in with an entire truckload of cash, setting it down at the cashier, filled with cash. And they're, the, the banker's just in there going, oh, my God. You know, shaking his head, looking at it, going, okay, I got to hide this because there's really no – cover for it. It's just the bankers going, okay, we'll put this through. There's a whole bunch of transactions. We'll get it through. And there was no recording of it. But back in the 80s, they were able to do that and get large amounts of currency into the bank. Then 9-11 happened and they discovered that a lot of businesses had been set up and were able to pass huge amounts of currency into the U.S., through businesses in this way to fund the terrorist activities which resulted in 9-11. So as a result, 
they had some things that they set up to uh, stop this. And the biggest one they set up is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And you will need to know this name. This is probably one of the most important names. It will be on the test. FENCEN, remember that one, okay? It's really simple to remember. It's just kind of like it rhymes, FINCEN. I always seem to get it backwards in SENFEN. I don't know why I do, but it's FINCEN, okay? And it's the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And this was set up, so remember, all the banks were pretty much separate entities for a long time. And they actually started a huge network so that Al Capone could not do his stuff anymore. Okay, back when he used to do all the speakeasy stuff and all that, and Al Capone went to prison for tax evasion. That will not occur anymore because now all the banks are required to talk to the IRS, required to report these things, and required to make sure the terrorists are not able to do that anymore. Okay, so anytime any business, now this is not just the banks. Now we think about this as the banks when people are walking in with large amounts of money. All right, I mean, where do you have large currency transactions? Where would you have large currency transactions occur? You don't usually have it at Fred Meyers. Okay, I admit that. Not at a brokerage because they don't take cash. They don't Auto take cash. Yeah. Auto dealership usually doesn't. The reason is most of them do not accept cash. They, they cut it out. That's why if you go to an auto dealership, most of them will no longer take cash because of this. They don't want to have to report this all. They don't. It takes a lot to report this. And okay. Let me also put a couple of things in here that, uh, let me just see if I got it in here. Nope, I don't. So I didn't, I didn't actually put it in the presentation. Um, there are a couple of rules on this thing. Um, I didn't put the penalty up here. One of the things you do need to know about this, and you guys really do want to put this, this one in your notes. I come in on day one. When do I have to report this by? I have a $10,000 transaction. And when does that company have to report it by? And I do mean have to report it by. How long do they have to send in that form 8300? 15 days from the date of the receipt of the cash. You got it. Thank you, Garrett. 15 Whoa. days. And by the way, that is not a joke. The penalty for not doing it is huge. You do not want to be late. Trust me, I, I have known when things have they they have, when when things are starting to run late or there's a computer issue or something, the first thing that happens is you get on the phone with the IRS, especially when it's a company like the casino, which has think of how many of these in a day the casino has. Now there's a difference. If you're talking about a normal business which deals with, you know, maybe one of these a week or two of these a week or two of these a month. Okay. That's one thing. Okay. So getting it within the 15 days, you'd better have it in with those 15 days because you can actually hand write these. There's two ways to do this. Okay. These get submitted in one of two ways. They get submitted by e-file to FENCEN or they are mailed, it has to have the postmark within 15 days to the IRS, the actual mailed form, the form 8300. And FENCEN, understand something, FENCEN is just a branch of the IRS. It is the enforcement. It's the police version. It is their, their police. And by the way, they, do, they are an enforcement group. Don't get me wrong on that. Um, 15 days to e-file it. And it, it better be postmarked if it's going to the IRS. But if you are a large corporation like the casino, which has to file hundreds of these every week, okay, we're not talking about a few of them, they are required, they cannot mail them in, 
they are not allowed to mail them in because of the volume that they have, the number that they have to send in. They are not allowed to mail them in. They have to e-file them. They are required by the IRS to e-file them. So what happens if by chance their e-file, they have a special server which just handles their e-files for the 8300s, all their currency transaction reports. What happens if by chance it goes down? Now imagine the fines on hundreds of these. We're not talking a couple of these. We're not talking a few of these. We are talking hundreds to thousands of these. Not in a week's time? Holy cow. Can you imagine what the penalty fines alone would be? So the moment, <laughs> the moment that computer goes down, the IRS gets called and warned and their local agent that they actually know and that they actually, that they have a relationship with gets informed and they actually have their own contacts there that they specifically know that they deal with on a regular basis because things like that do happen. Okay. That things like that do happen that they actually know so they can call them and go, Hey, you know, Bob, the server's down, you know, we're just checking in to let you know we're getting it up as soon as possible. If there's any delay, we want you to be aware of it. And the IRS will be watching for them. So there, if there are some that are late, they're, they're noted, but they're not penalized for it necessarily because they were already warned ahead of time that there might be an issue. Okay. And they know to be looking for it. Because normally, if that happens and somebody blatant, because the, the idea is, I, I guess you want to put it this way the intent of that 15 days. If you are not intending for that to occur and you let them know and everybody's on board and online and they know that it's happening and they know that there's an error and that they won't penalize you, especially because of the volume. But if you just blow it off and miss that 15 days, the penalty is huge. It can be up to twice the amount that was the transaction itself. Okay, and that penalty will vary. And that also includes interest too, by the way. So when you start to look at it, the penalties, especially if you were talking hundreds of these, can cost you more than you would make in weeks. So you will not miss this one. So a lot of companies will not even deal with that currency now. They will not handle Traveler's checks. That's why some of them will say, will not accept traveler's checks. Um, most places even will not accept wire transfers now. Um, when you talk about, here's one thing that's important. When you talk about wire transfers. Now, Garrett, you brought up car dealerships, right? Yep. The car dealerships themselves do not accept wire transfers. The financial, financial institutions that handle the car loans where you're doing your down payment kind of thing and whatnot or transferring of funds, they're the only ones who do. They specifically handle it and do the currency transaction reports between. And that's one of the other things is a difference too. Remember, think about something. Banks have to transfer funds between banks all the time. So these forms do not occur. There's an electronic record of when these things transfer between banks like that from one to the other. So they do not have to get reported in that sense. Okay. From like bank to bank transfers, they know they're going to occur all the time, you know, like that where they just have to flow money. But if it's going from a client to another client from bank to bank in that sense, yes, it has to be reported. Anytime it's a client to a client with a wire transfer or something like that, it does have to be reported. But anytime it's like a bank sending funds from, from a bank to another bank, because money does flow that in that sense, that does not get reported. On the, How can I put this? Let me do this so you're not confused by that. Let me do this. Whiteboard share. Okay. Let me put it this way. 
here's a client and here's a client. Anytime money flows from here to here and it's $10,000 or more, it has to be reported when it's any of those forms of transaction, a wire transfer, cashier's check, where it's an instant form of money. And now they really want to do it on Bitcoin because it's the same thing. And ironically enough, a lot of them now want to also do it like when it's a gold exchange. You know, because you can do gold to gold, which gold, silver, platinum, because that is a concern because you can do gold exchange like that. All right. But here is the difference. If you're going bank to bank, remember a lot of times banks have to transfer funds between each other for the flow of cash. This does not get reported. Okay. But if this wire transfer is going, like this is a wire transfer through your bank, going here, like so, then yes, this does get reported. Because you are still doing a person to a person through your bank. Okay. Anytime it's a person to a person, it does get reported. Whether that's a direct one or through a bank, that does get reported. Um, and in this case, the reporting, in this case, the bank does do the reporting here. And in the, because if you're, if you do the wire transfer, this person is going to report that they, that they had a wire transfer. And what's going to end up happening is this bank is usually going to report to FinCEN that they did a wire transfer for this amount. Um, they're both ba basically protecting themselves. I know it sounds kind of like it's <laughs> a lot in that sense. It's really important that you understand this form. It's probably one of the most important forms that came about. It was actually, believe it or not, in place to a large extent before 9-11, but it really wasn't enforced in that sense. Because I was, back in the 90s, I was still, I was having to do a large currency transaction log and that but it wasn't so enforced okay after 9 11 it really became serious um this will be on your test ten thousand dollars the specific type you know cash any anything that's in it and you need to look for it now the question is like i said a check I give you a check for $15,000. I give it to a business for $15,000. I walk into that car dealership and give that guy a check for $15,000. Is that required to have that form? At the car dealership, a, a regular check. I write, I write him a personal check for $15,000. Is that reportable? No, because it's not a no. cash transaction. It's, it's not considered it. Now, I walk in with a money order. Is that one reportable? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Lisa got it. Money orders are the same thing as cash. I walk in with a traveler's check, a currency, uh, a cashier's check, a money order, um, any of those, remember, those things count just like cash. You remember, you paid for those things. You are walking around with cash in your hand. Those are the important ones. Is what you're holding in your hand basically cash? That's the easiest way to think about it. Is what you're holding in your hand basically cash? And that's the biggest way to think about it. If it is, that has to be reported. Cash Money order, traveler's checks, um, cashier's checks, uh, believe it or not, like I said, gold, um, and wire transfers, okay? Those have to be reported. 
And when do they have to be reported? 15 days. You got it, Lisa. 15 days, and you do not want to miss that deadline. What did you say the penalty was? It's a percentage or how much? Um, it will vary, but it is up to um, – well, I got to go back and double check because it has changed. But – and this is an I believe, and I'll get you an exact answer on Friday because I will double check because I know the penalty was up to two times the actual transaction amount. So hold off on that one. I will give you the exact number because I think it changed. It was up to two times the entire the amount of the transfer. So let's say you had a thirty thousand dollar transaction. You're talking the penalty is sixty thousand dollars plus interest. Yeah. Okay. So let me check on that one to double check because uh, I don't want you to be wrong on that one. So I will look to find out the penalty for the eighty three hundred. Because when I was doing this, I realized I didn't have the current one. I had an older number. So, penalty for. Oh, I'll tell you what, never mind. I'm just going to do this. Let's take a look. Let me look. And I put the glasses on so I can see it. And let's take a look. Well, that doesn't like it. It says one hundred dollars per statement not to exceed one million five per calendar year. Okay, yes, they did. <laughs> to furnish it, it's 250 currently. Now, this is what I'm saying. Uh, I got to look here. I don't want to go off that one. I want to go IRC off this one. section 6722A1. There we go. It's, there's so many different penalties. Penalty for intentional yeah, charge. Yeah, there's the intentional penalty one for negligent failure. Yeah, that's why, because there's because we just got informed. It may just be here. We go civil penalties. Uh, here, not to exceed one point five million dollars per calendar year. Right. For, yeah. Or it's it's also one hundred dollars per statement. Right. Failure to file, it can be reduced to thirty dollars. If you file, if you fail to correct one, it's uh, the penalty is thirty dollars with a ceiling of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, here, intentional disregard uh, to furnish timely, correct, and complete notices two hundred and fifty dollars per failure. Right. If or if greater. 10% of the aggregate amount of the items required to be reported correctly, which is a whole lot more. Yeah, the greater of uh, 25,000 right. for the amount of cash received, not to exceed 100,000. That's then why even failure is different. Yeah, see, and then there's I'm, also yeah, the you, failures. The, let's just put it this way the failures for not fail, they, they will find you forever they want to because it also changes here for returns due to be filed during calendar year 2018 mm -hmm. versus 2017 versus 2019. Of course. Plus the criminal penalties. 
except if it's a Sunday and you're standing on your left foot. <laughs> it's like, so that's why I said this is, this is going to change a little bit. So um, because not only are there the payment penalties, a person may be subject to criminal penalties um, for stopping or trying to stop a Form 8300 from being filed, willfully falsifying or fraudulent form, or failing to file a form, or setting up or trying to set up a transaction in a way that would make it, to, make it seem unnecessary to file this form. Uh, the penalties... <laughs> prison okay. okay so up to five years plus the cost of prosecution so they don't cover the penalties in the past key online book where it talks about this under business reporting requirements in the first chapter that's why i asked if you knew what it was so it sounds like it's more complicated than it is we're gonna be it is way <laughs> past the testing here because <laughs> Looking at it, you wouldn't believe oh, yeah. the number of possibilities. It's based upon what day of the week it is. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like the penalties themselves. At, at one point, the penalties were literally two times, up to two times the amount of the transaction. And that just may be for the casino version because it's actually based on gaming law too, which yeah, is a whole right. different section. And this is, you know, individual law or business, you know. Right. So, so the, but anyways, it, it kind of falls under the same thing. So that's one of the important things, though. But this is if you actually do it. I'm just talking about the dollar penalties. You start flowing through this. And this is for everyone. There's also the criminal penalties, which come in here. It's up to uh, sanctions include a fine up to twenty five thousand uh, dollars, a hundred thousand dollars in the case of a corporation, and or imprisonment up to five years plus the cost of prosecution. Three years. So, so, <laughs> uh, then it say it also says right below that up to three years plus the cost of prosecution. So pretty much, I have no idea technically what the overall is, but let's just say you don't want to do it. Okay, because you can spend time in jail, and you could have fines, which are exorbitant. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one actually says within a calendar year up to one point five million dollars. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> let's just say that you don't want to do it. All right, um, you want to, you know, you need to know for the test. You need to make any corrections within thirty days. And here are the important two important dates. Number one, you have to file within 15 days. Note these two things here. You have to file within 15 days. You have to correct it if there's a mistake within 30 days. Those are the two important dates that you have to know. And those are pretty much universal amongst all of them. And the reason I'm saying this and why I'm stressing this form so much is because this applies to every corporation. It doesn't matter the corporation type. It does not matter the, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, product you sell, the service you sell. This is really important in this sense. And we do have, like we said, especially here, we have marijuana, which is a cash crop. And it's expensive, guys. And uh, there's a lot of cash that gets exchanged at these places. And there's a reason why they have no windows on the half of those stores and bars on the windows that are there. Um, they have a lot of cash in those buildings because a lot exchanges hands. And they have to get noted. Now, unfortunately, I'm pretty sure a lot of them don't get reported. And like I said, it's within a single business day because a lot of people come and go. Uh, they come in in the morning, they come in in the afternoon, they come in in the evening. Give a lot of cash and buy it multiple times. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we are noting now that is a um, bad thing that they're trying to, to clamp down on, as a matter of fact, is because... What is legal here that is not legal in most of the other states? Marijuana. What happens when 
somebody in Utah wants to buy marijuana. They come to Oregon? Well, it costs a lot to just get into a car. Well, it probably doesn't cost that much to get the car and just drive from Utah and just drive to Oregon and get marijuana or Washington and get it and drive back home. What they'll do is they'll contact a person who's basically a dealer and illegally send it FedEx, whatever, in a box packed inside of stuff. They buy it here. It's perfectly legal. And they ship it over there. Can't do it to the post office. No, well, there are certain. Cheaper just to you go to your corner dealer. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, like I said, I didn't say it was. I did not say it was legal. I just said you know. So um, there I, are a lot of people think about it. I want to make a lot of money. What can I do? I start going and buying up a whole bunch of pot at a whole bunch of dispensaries here. Sell it in other states across, you know, I get on the dark web or whatever and start putting out, so people start learning. I'm a dealer. I'm sitting here. I'm in this state. I ship it out across to that state. Isn't there a federal law against distribution? Yes, across there is. The yes, there is. And it's, man, it's illegal to do it. I'm not, trust me, let me put the disclaimer in here. What I am not saying is legal. <laughs> It is illegal. It's perfectly legal to go buy it here and have it for myself. And when I go to try to sell it across the state line, it's illegal. You can't even take pot from Oregon into Washington. Correct. You, you can't. You it's can't. Illegal. It's illegal to do that because that's that's uh, transportation of a controlled substance across state lines. And the laws which govern Oregon versus Washington are different. So, yes, it is illegal to do that. So that's a federal crime that way. That's big time. That's a big crime. And right now, even though the feds are looking the other way, more or less on Oregon and Washington and California or whatever, you know, Colorado, um, allowing marijuana, um, you start moving it across state lines like that, they are not going to look the other way. So what happens is, is some guys have gotten creative. You want to start selling marijuana to places where you can make a lot of money? Think about it. Marijuana has flooded the market here. You go down and pretty much on every other street corner, there's a marijuana dispensary. Okay. You go buy it in bulk. We're talking these large transactions. Again, this is why it's tracked. If you go into a marijuana dispensary today and you're going, I have customers who want to buy a lot of marijuana. Okay. Okay. So I go in there with $20,000 in cash, or let's say I've got $20,000 in cash and I need to buy up $20,000 worth of marijuana. So in the morning I buy 2,000, in the morning I buy 4,000, in the morning I buy 3,000, and you know, in the afternoon I buy another 6,000. Um, I'm buying up small amounts, well, not necessarily small amounts, a thousand bucks worth or whatever, okay. Then I go home or to wherever I'm working out of and I package them all up and I send them off to other states, to my customers in other states where it's illegal. Those transactions where I was buying them up, that's how they would track you because those should be reported. Now I'm going to start to try to hide it by doing, now how would, now think about this, this report's important. This report is $10,000 in a single business day. Now, what's important about what I just said there? I was going below that $10,000 mark, wasn't I? Yeah, you're only going to do $9,500. <laughs> there you go. But remember something. It does say $10,000 in a single business day, but there is actually a log which goes below that amount. Businesses are required they're not necessarily, let me put it this way. If you deal in currency transactions on a regular basis, the IRS really does want you to keep a log of transactions below that amount. So they can see if somebody's going in on Monday buying, like you said, $9,500 worth that day, 
on Tuesday or Wednesday going in and buying $9,800 that day. On the next day going in and getting $9,600 that day, they know they're going in just below the amount to try to avoid it. Okay. It also means that usually they do, like I said, the casino tries to do, I think it's $2,000 or more. The reason is it also does, let's say I'm going into Bob's Pot Shop on Monday, getting $2,000 there uh, Monday morning. On Monday morning, I also go up to Cindy's Pot Shop, Wendy's Pot Shop, Tom's Pot Shop, and I'm spending $2,000 at each one. Okay. What happens is, is those logs are also important because they're a currency transaction log. It's the same thing as basically the 8300 report, which goes in uh, 15 days. But when you're keeping your records, you do want to keep the log of transactions that are large currency transactions that are less than the 10,000 because throughout the day, you need to, and that's the form that goes with this in a sense, that so if it adds up to the 10,000, you need to be able to show where those parts were. Let me, uh, let me explain that in a little bit of detail here because that's also part of this that's a little more complicated. In a single transaction, we're talking about I've got my pot and I go in and buy it for $11,000, okay? And I go spend $11,000 on this in one transaction. And it gets reported, right? It generates the report and all, and it gets noted. But instead, I come in in the morning and I get $2,000 worth and put this this way. I come in at 12 and I get uh, $4,000 worth. I come in at three and I get uh, $3,000 worth. Now, if you think about it right there, I'm at $9,000 right now. So if I come back at six o'clock, now let's say I'll, I'll go, I'll go later. Now, what, what, what do you work normally? Nine to five? Right? Normal business hours, yeah. Normal business hours, nine to five. Is this this is this is shift one? Right? Shift one. So I wait until eight o'clock and I go in here and instead I get six thousand dollars worth then who's gonna know because this is the guy who's working from five this is the five to what would it be five to what one and one five to one shift right mm-hmm does the five to one shift know anything? The nine to five shift knows I bought $9,000 worth of pot. Right? Mm -hmm. The five to one shift knows I bought $6,000 worth of pot. Right? Right. So did they file a report? No, I didn't know any better. They, they didn't know. I mean, it was like, but what they do is they have a log. So if I went in and bought $11,000, they file a report. But if I work the nine to five, this guy's working the nine to five shift and I bought $9,000 worth. Then I waited a little bit later and I come in when the next guy's working and I bought another $6,000 worth. Did the guy on the morning shift know to tell the guy on the evening shift, hey, by the way, 
Bob over here has been coming in here, and he bought $9,000 worth of pot so far, so watch for him. Shouldn't it be in the log for that day? Thank you. That's the important thing. There's also with this, not just the form you fill out, but there is a uh, large currency transaction log that goes with this form. And it is... This form is the one that actually has to get filed. But for every day, there is a log for this that leads up to the form. And what it says is basically, and you have to, you have to really use your own judgment, okay? Each business is, is kind of responsible for it. Um, the rule of thumb is $2,000 or more, okay? That's a good rule of thumb. I mean, if somebody comes in and does $500, they would have to come in a lot to get a $10,000. They'd literally have to come in 20 times to get a $10,000 transaction, okay, if they're doing 500 bucks a pop. All right. And uh, they would have to come in 20 times to equal that $10,000. But so a good rule of thumb is $2,000 or more. And what they do is they have to log um, the time, who it is, um, what the transaction was, the transaction description, you know, cash in, cans out, that sort of thing, and the amount. So you can at least kind of get an idea as to what it was. And the idea is you're keeping just a running log, a, a, a tab, okay? And these are usually just the pre-printed sheets, okay? So, and you put this on there, and again, like I said, the rule of thumb, and this is not, a, it's not like it's written in stone or something, is it's $2,000 or more. Anytime that person comes in. And throughout the day, and you keep just a different sheet for every day, and this can be electronic. You know, this can be an electronic sheet right in the computer system. So if you're running a business and you've got a point of sale system and you need to log a transaction, you just basically tell it log uh, a currency transaction uh, entry, okay? And it'll note, and it'll ask you the questions. You know, it'll note the time immediately. And it'll note the information about the transaction. It'll ask you questions like, who was this? And, you know, do we have their information on file already? Um, sometimes if it's description uh, or like who it is, um, who can be something like literally uh, who, and it'll be name, it'll be their name, and then just info on file, like if it's a regular person because you will keep an ongoing file on who they are, if they're a regular customer. If they are not a regular customer, all right, you will want to try to get it. Um, now, don't worry about it for the first transaction or the second transaction, but if it starts becoming, you know, a, a higher amount, like if you're talking $8,000 where you're getting pretty close, you're gonna wanna see a driver's license or something like that that identifies them. Uh, because if it gets over the $10,000 amount, amount you, before you can do the transaction, you have to have it. You have to have that information. You have to have a social security number or an I-10. All right, you have to have something that identifies them. Um, and this is a log, and it goes on throughout the day. And this log then solves this problem. So that when he did his $9,000 in the morning for the first shift, now employee number one during that first part of the day, you had your $9,000. Oh, shift two, you're doing six thousand. Um, you know, sir, you're at $15,000. I'm gonna need to see your driver's license because we do have to file uh, a large currency transaction report with the IRS for this. And then you'll see the guy leave the store real fast. So anyway, but that is what you have to keep throughout the day 
to avoid that because they will try to break the transactions up instead of doing that one eleven thousand or fifteen thousand dollar transaction they will try to break it up during the day so you keep a running log of any time there are transactions of like two thousand dollars three thousand depends on how much it depends on the number of transactions you do throughout the day if you're doing a bunch of transactions with thousands of dollars you want to keep a running log of anything like two thousand dollars or more if you have just a few transactions during the day where your total for the day is like one or two um, above, you know, two thousand, three thousand dollars, just do it at the three thousand dollar mark because you, you're going to note them then. Um, it's kind of based on how much business you do of the large transactions. Make sure, and here's the most important part. When this does exceed the $10,000 mark, you have certain information you're going to need. So now let's actually take a look. Let me do this. I am going to pull this up. So you guys, I want you guys to see it. Let me do this. And I'm going to send this out to you guys so you guys can see it. So you guys have a real idea of what we're talking about here. I'm going to share this with you. That's what we want right there. Okay, so it's interactive. Now, can you guys see that? Yeah. Can you guys see the form? Yep. Yes. All right. This is the actual form. Now, it is, again, like I said, um, it is only for a business. You don't have to do this for people, but there are actually, I should put this in a different way, because there is a secondary part of this. Um... And this form is really important because you'll notice that there is a second box on this, this form. And I'm going to explain it to you because it's a special box. And we're going to come back to it. Identity of person whom the cash was received. It has to have this taxpayer identification number. It has to have a social security number for them. If you have um, a foreign individual who does not have it, it has to include a 1042S uh, for them or something which gives them an I-10 number that's been assigned to them or something of that nature. Or if they don't have it, you actually have to have, it's the 1042S to give them the acknowledgement that you've seen some document identifying who they are, a passport or some type of ID or they are just basically certifying who they are and it requires their signature. Okay, that's an important part. It requires their signature. Mainly because they are taking responsibility for it now. Their signature goes on the form and it says basically that they are acknowledging that they are that person and that they are not doing this for illegal activities and they are not doing anything of, you know, whatever nature. And it goes through here. And if the person is not necessarily available in this case, like you don't necessarily know it, you also do have to know if it was a business. Okay. You have to identify the business type. If it was a, if it was a person that you were conducting business for who it was, um, like they do not, you do not have that person reporting it, you have to report it. And we'll, we'll get into this a, a little bit because there's a special box that I was going to associate with that. And then this is the description. Did it have a money order, a cashier's check, bank draft, traveler's checks? Again, like I said, these are, if you think about it, these are, uh, the immediate currency. That's what these are. These are the same thing as real cash in hand, 
a cashier's check, a money order, a bank draft, a traveler's check, U.S. currency. Um, now, this is important. Amounts in $100 bills or higher because they're trying to identify, did somebody walk in here with, well, and again, the, the reason is, is there aren't any bills in the United States except for the highest bill. What is, here's a trivia question for the day. What is the highest bill printed in the United States? I don't know. 50000 thousand. dollars bill. Thousand dollar bill, I think. Uh, Garrett got it. Sheila got it. Yep. Have you guys ever seen a thousand dollar bill? Once. No. Nope, because they're not in circulation. Thousand dollar bills are printed because they're just from bank to bank transfers. When they, for whatever reason, they have to transfer them. That's just for bank to bank uh, transfers. They go and secure things, and they're just moved from bank to bank. They don't actually put them in circulation. Um, I've seen one of the old thousand dollar bills when they before they actually took some out of circulation. That was a long, long, long time ago. Okay, but even when I was working in the bank when I was in college, not a single thousand dollar bill. Only a hundred dollar bills are in circulation now. Okay, but and that's a big but. Um, you notice this category B says foreign currency. There are currencies out there that have bills where it's not necessarily, because we go by dollars, even though it's not necessarily whatever. Um, foreign currency, even though it's saying dollars and you have to say in U.S. dollar equivalents, some currencies out there have dollars that are worth more than $100 in U.S. currency. You have to do the conversion, like 50 pesos in the Philippines is a dollar. I only know that because I got to do it all the time. And so they have currency that may be worth more than $100. I can't think of any. I don't know if the Philippines does have anything worth more than $100. But anyway, um, and you have to specify the country that it's from. But there are countries out there that have dollars that are worth more than $100. And you have to identify them because if you're going to counterfeit something, are you going to counterfeit a dollar bill? Or are you going to counterfeit a $100 bill? Uh, it'd probably $20 be <laughs> twenty dollar bill. There you go, counterfeit the twenty. Okay, at least. But most of the time, you know, they 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 want to track that in case you're trying to counterfeit a hundred dollar bill or something like that. So that's why they try to to track the hundred dollar bill for that. And start going through here, and they also, if it has these, the cashier's checks and that sort of thing, and the country uh, that the money came from, and the cashier's checks, these things, who issued them, that sort of thing. All right. Type of transaction. They want to know what it was for. You know, uh, bail received by court, cl court clerks. So some people do walk and remember something. There is one thing that you have to remember. Bail money. Most court clerks do not receive. They have to take cash. Okay, if you go to jail and that guy, guy goes, it's $50,000 bail. Okay, what has to happen with that one? I would go to a bondsman. And go to a bondsman in Oregon. Mm, thank you. What's a bail bond? A like bond that's to do the appearance in, in court. Uh, but what's a bail bond count as? Cash. Thank you. It is cash. It, you've purchased it. It is cash. So when this one right here says bail received by court clerks, you are handing them cash. Um, so in tan now here's the important one. Intangible property purchased. Okay, what would that be? When I think of intangible property purchased. Tangible um, property is like intellectual property. Right. There you go. Also, what would Copyright an intellectual... Or... Like a trademark? Trademarks, things like that. But also, art is, in a sense, considered intangible because it has no... It, it's intrinsic value. It's because it's what you want. It has no set value. So it's it's kind of... They, they toss it up between personal property purchased and intangible property because it's considered what you think it's worth. Um, 
So it's kind of a throw up between those two. Exchange your trust funds. Now, here's a big one. What can go in an escrow account? I'm buying a house. Yes. I am buying. Oh, no. Let's go back to our original one here. Well, I, I mean, I, if I'm a realtor, I would accept a check. Uh, yeah, I know. But remember, I did real estate for lots and lots of years. What do people want to put it? What can count as escrow? What can count as what can count as what's considered uh, interest money? Your consideration. What can count as it? Never sold houses. Hmm. Now, most of you will assume that as you give them a check to say with that offer, it's called interest money and it goes into escrow. And okay, when you're selling a house, okay, what goes with the house? All the good land. Land, the trees. What about the tractor? Oh, mineral rights. Are you talking about like mineral rights? Mm, you name it. The mineral rights could be. What about the tractor? What about the uh, those things that set on top? Those uh, your car. Oh, really? oh, if you throw if you throw in that car with it, um, you know what? The guy drives up in a Ferrari. And he wants to buy your house. You really like that Ferrari. Now remember, everything in this world is negotiable. You throw that Ferrari in, I'll sell you the house. You give me what I'm asking. You throw that, you know, it, it, what you're offering. You throw that Ferrari in with it. I'll take it. Oh my gosh, the word's right on the tip of my tongue because I did real estate too, and I could just harder. Didn't think about. It. Which is a, uh, reported on the C. Mm -hmm. It's a personal property. It's chattel. It's the or. It's considered an interest. It's considered consideration. It is actually your down payment on the house. It is part of your currency. So when you are reporting it. That other intangible that goes into escrow, that car that I just named off, goes into escrow. So its value is now considered cash. That's a form of barter exchange. It's cash. So escrow or trust funds, it's now part of it. So, you know, you walk into it. That is personal property, which just became part of your exchange. That's consideration. That is your interest check. That is your interest money. By interest, I mean saying, I have interest in your property, intent to purchase. Earnest money. Earnest money. She got it. Thank you. I was waiting for somebody to come up with it. Oh, I, I told you it was right she on got the it. My tongue, and I couldn't figure out the word. And because I did, I did real estate as well, and I was always collecting earnest money. Uh-huh. It is called your earnest money. It means I am sincere. I am earnest. It is your earnest money, and it can be any form of anything. It's like, you you know, you see those TV ads where they say, bring in anything, and it will count as your down payment against a car. The same holds true with just about any transaction in the world. Anything can be your earnest money. And thank you, Lisa. That was good. I knew it. I knew one of you would come up with it eventually. It is your earnest money, and it counts as it goes into escrow. So that car, how do you count it? It has a value of what is called its fair market value. Okay? If that's a, who knows, a beautiful Ferrari, you know, an, an antique vintage Ferrari, and you look at it, and it's worth like $250,000, and you're sitting there going, Dang, I like that thing, you know, and you're, they pull up to this, you know, $10 million mansion and, you know, think about it. This is how you know, rock stars exchange stuff, right? Man, you give me that $4 million plus that car, we're good to go. What did that car just become? That car just became your earnest money on the, on the account. That car just became currency and that car has a value of what? 
whatever its fair market value is. And it has to be reported because that is now exactly what we were talking about earlier when we said you buy diamonds here and sell them over here. That's the same thing as buying art and that sort of thing. Now, in this particular case, I was saying, you know, whatever, but it has to go through a real estate agent in this form. You know, we're not talking about, you know, just Bob driving up to Tim and saying, I want to buy your house. This is when Tim has his house for sale through a real estate agent. There's an actual business involved. So Bob comes up, likes that million, you know, $50 million mansion or whatever. He pulls up in his Ferrari and you know, Tim walks out. I'll save the house for that as long as you throw that Ferrari in. That Ferrari just became whatever its fair market value is. Okay. And see, this is where it's saying specific description or property. Okay. This actually counts in a sense as currency being exchanged. So when it comes under basically an other type of transaction, this is an escrow thing that's going to go into escrow. Okay. And you're going to note it. When it, on here because you just exchanged a car for its fair market value as part of it in this transaction. Now, again, nobody's going to blink twice at this because it'll probably be two rock stars doing it or whatever. But that is how people would hide money in and out of a transaction. I buy a high-end car over here and I sell it over here. That's why you have. You were saying, Lisa, go ahead. I mean, th that's why you can't just uh, flat out buy a house for cash. From Thank you. The, the paper. You have to <laughs> yeah. go through escrow. You have to go. There has to be a trail. A trail, yeah. You can't yeah. buy it with cash in a brown paper bag. <laughs> go try it. That's yeah. actually kind of fun. You know, it's kind of like that is kind of fun. No, it has to go through uh, through escrow then. Escrow has to do the closing because of that. And they have to track what those things are. And then it has to show the businesses that received the cash. Who got it? Who was the one who handled it? What their, and by the way, look at this. Who they were, their EIN number, or who they actually were with their social security number, their type of business, and their signature. Man, they actually have to sign. They want to know your, you know, your blood type here. All right, you have to provide everything. They want to know date of the signature, print it, and their contact phone number. They want to be able to get a hold of you if you if you have a, if something happens. They want, and then here more people involved. Their occupation. All right. Date of birth. I mean, we're not talking, we're, they aren't kidding around here anymore. It used to be, you know, what happened? That was about it. Oh, we got money. Cool. All right. Whatever. And the information about the business. And then here, this is what's really fun. Alien identification card. This is when you start getting into, um, let me see here. Box 15 is this one. Let me see here. Yes. On behalf of more than one person. So in other words, if it's multiple people, you start getting into this one where you start filling out multiple people, their organizations. And then anything that was not explained in the first part, you explain here. Now, Remember back when I told you? Now, now also, here's an important part. This is, as you can tell, an official IRS form. It's also an official FENCEN form. That's why I said you'll recognize it as FENCEN, just like the IRS has that, but nobody ever calls it the Internal Revenue Service. It's the IRS. FENCEN is the Financial uh, Crimes Enforce Enforcement Network. You will need to recognize it as FENCEN and know what that stands for. Um, they are a branch of this. They are the same people. They are literally, this is the police force of this. Okay. And they have full authority to be the police force of this, of the IRS. Um, 
and they do have their own i mean we're talking armed police force not just a not just a couple of guys you know accountants sitting in a back room this is armed police force now remember what i said back here at the very top there's a neat little box that i was I said i was going to talk about in a later time but we we're going to talk about when i got to the end of it it's back up here see this one here check appropriate box if this part here. Now, there's two boxes after that. See what the two boxes are after it? Amends a prior report. Well, that's pretty simple. That means I made a mistake on a prior report and I'm just fixing it, right? Uh, yeah, amends prior report A. That, be, that makes it an amendment. That means I made a mistake on a prior one. I'm just fixing it. Now let's take a look at what's behind curtain number two. Look at that one. Vicious transaction. This is the most dangerous box in the world. This is what calls a SARS report. Suspicious Activities Report. Suspicious Activity Reports, SARS. SARS is the, I don't trust you. I don't know why I don't trust you. When I said that this form is for $10,000 or more, this is for $10,000 or more when I think you are legitimate, okay? When, you know, hey, I did a $10,000 transaction with you. I did it, you know, and everything was cool. You seem like a nice guy. You did whatever. The guy walks in and has his, you know, we were just talking about you can't buy the house with the all the cash in the paper bag. The guy walks in and has the paper bag with a whole bunch of old $20 bills crinkled up, held together by a bunch of rubber bands. And he's walking up and going, yeah, I just want to buy that thing over there, whatever it may be, you know. And its value is like $4,000. Yeah, here. Yeah, I got cash for it. And it's something, you know, art or something, you know, like we were talking about again, something with intrinsic value, something like gold. Again, let's go with gold. Gold's a good one. Okay. Gold is a very good one because it doesn't necessarily lose its value. If I'm buying gold, I can take a piece of gold from Oregon, walk across to Philadelphia wherever, walk across to more or less just about anywhere, I can buy up a piece of gold in China, come across to the U.S., walk over to Utah into a place and say, hey, I have this piece of gold. I want some cash. Okay. They will usually give you cash for it. All right. Um, I walk into a place and I walk in and I say, I want that piece of gold. All right, it has a lot of value or something like that. You know, it's a gold necklace. It's something like this. And I would like to buy it, and its value is $8,000. Let's go with that number. It's a good number. It's below the $10,000 limit. So it's not too suspicious. It's below the $10,000. And so it's not a transaction within a single day. And the guy hands you $8,000 in old $20 bills for this chunk of gold necklace that you think is actually, or, you know, just a big chunk of gold, whatever, gold nugget. Is that odd? Well, it's odd, but it's not over 10,000. No, yeah, but it is odd though. It's not one of, it's one of those things where you're going, this guy just walked in and bought a $8,000 chunk. But, you know, had he walked in and said, you know, that thing is cool. All right, you know what? Here's my card. You know, I wanna, I wanna get it. 
you know, here's my here's my bank card. Let's you know charge it and we'll get it. That's one thing, right? Because we're talking eight thousand dollars, eight thousand, not you know, eighty bucks, not seventy bucks. We're talking eight thousand bucks, and this guy walks in with a paper bag with eight thousand dollars in small crumpled up old bills, all rubber banded together. And lays them out on the counter for you. And you're going, great, at least I don't have to file the 8300. Is that true? Because there's a second part of this form that's really important. Is that true that you don't have to file this report? I would because who knows where you No, got no, 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 no. I'm, I'm asking outright. Is that true that you don't have to file this report? No, I don't think you have to. No, uh, uh, you have to file this report. That second box on here, and there you're required to. It's in the actual FENSEN reports. As a matter of fact, <laughs> get this. You'll you'll love this at the casino. If they don't have a certain number of these reports, they actually get in trouble. They actually have to have a certain percentage of these because they expect to have a number of people um, trying to do exactly what we just described you know, trying to do the illegal things. So if they don't have um, a certain number of SARS report, FinCEN starts to come to them and ask them, what is going on here? Where are your SARS reports? But if you have something going on like this, you are actually required to report it. Even though it's below the $10,000 mark, or you could slide and not report it. I mean, that's not a problem. They're gonna not, probably not catch you. And it's not, it's not a big deal. You know, but are you supposed to report that? Absolutely. SARS is a big thing that the uh, Financial Crimes Network actually requires, the Enforcement Network. This box is below, even if it's below $10,000, you need to report it. And the reason is, like I was talking about earlier, when... I come in to pot shop A, B, C, and D and buy that $2,000 today. Um, I go into Tim's, Tina's, Cindy's, Wendy's, you know, whatever, and I buy that $2,000, $3,000, $5,000, $1,000, and I do it on Monday. No big deal, right? Wednesday comes around, and I do it again. I'm buying... 3,000, 1,000, 9,000, whatever. Okay, well, all right, fine, no problem. And then on Saturday, I go do it again. I buy 4,000, 6,000, you know, 1,000, 9,000, all below the amounts that are below $10,000. But I'm buying them at multiple different stores, right? What happens? Does anybody report it? According to the thing, it's all below $10,000. It's all at different stores. Does it get reported anywhere? Nope. But if you think about this, let's go back to the whiteboard. Let me take a look here at the whiteboard. And we'll diagram this out kind of so you understand what I'm talking about. When I was talking about, again, this one here, where, well, okay, this was a single day. Now let's go the other way so you understand just how important this is. If, here's, oh, let's use a different shape. So you can see that they're buildings. Let's go like this. I'm kind of tired of the green, too. How about you guys? So... We got all these different pot shops. Now it's cool. Today, on then this is Monday. I go to this one and I get a thousand bucks in cash. And I go to this one. And I do 2,000, 
then this one I do 4,000. And this one I do 6,000. And this one I do 1,000, just like this. This one I do 5,000. Does it get reported anywhere? No. Nope, nobody reports it. But then again, I do the same thing, and I won't change the dollar amounts or anything to make it complicated, so it'll take up that time. But I do it again on Wednesday. And I, and I do the same basic thing. And I do it again on Friday. And I do it again on Sunday. And this guy starts looking because he did, you know, all his 4,000. He did his uh, 7,000. He did his uh, 3,000. All in cash over four days. And this guy here also saw that he did 2,000. Um, 5,000. And 4,000, right? Would this ever be reported normally? If you think the think of the $10,000, would this ever be reported? No. No. But that box is saying, this guy is looking at it. Now, this may not be everybody, but this guy is looking at his reports across the week. Remember that log we were keeping? And he looks and he goes, wait a minute, this guy has been in on, and instead of looking today, he didn't do a transaction that reported that I needed to report for the week. But my God, for this week, this guy has come in on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday and done $16,000 here in the week. How much pot is this guy smoking? And then this guy happens to notice, he goes, my God, this guy has been in here. He's done $12,000 this week. He's done well over for the week this amount. I mean, I know he didn't do it in a single day, and I'm not really, you know, it didn't fall under the I need to report it category. But this is kind of suspicious. Is he doing something that, and, and again, like I said, for certain businesses, because they are current, cash currency, they, FinCEN will expect you as a business. Now, remember, we're talking about the reporting requirements for a business, all right? Um, and this is what you need to remember because these are the requirements that a business must adhere to. And there are certain differences based on what you do, all right, and what you sell. It will change based on, I mean, if you're Fred Myers. They're not going to worry about it so much, okay? You are not going in there and getting, you know, $15,000 worth of Twinkies, all right? Well, I mean, if you are, good for you, but Fred Myers is not typically selling that. Cars happens. Marijuana, it happens. Um, 7-Eleven is probably, again, you're not getting, you know, $12,000 worth of Slurpees. Um casinos it happens daily every hour all right so depending upon your tr your actual product the services if you have high-end services um it can happen uh, limousine companies i mean think about it if you have a whole bunch of transactions i mean you talk about some high-end business things like this high-end uh, uh really high-end stuff where currency is trans art if you have an art gallery those things sell for thousands and thousands. Sotheby's, these things, they sell for thousands and thousands of dollars. It exchanges at that rate daily. And you need to report it, and it's very important. So when I come back to this, let's, let's show you here. What did this guy note about this? Now, did he, when you think about this again, like I said, and let's take a look at this. This guy noted, and this guy noted that they had a customer, and let's just call him Bob. 
Okay. Bob was in here. Bob White. Sounds like a good name. Was in here literally four times this week and spent $16,000 on marijuana. If he is smoking that much weed, God help him. Okay? But I didn't have to report it because everyone was below that amount. But looking back on it, I kind of have a responsibility to say, this may not be normal. There may be something else going on here. Okay? There may be a problem here. Okay? He did, even though it does not fall into the $10,000 category, am I, required to, am, am I required to file it? Let me put it this way. Am I required to file this based on the $10,000? No. No. It doesn't meet it. Am I, according to FENCEN, because remember, what we're looking for is people doing wrong. That's the idea here. That's that box, by the way, the suspicious transaction. That special note. You're not noting the $10,000 necessarily. You're noting a high-value transaction that may or may not total the $10,000 or be pretty close or something, but something is off with it. Something is, something is happening that says, all right, I just need you to know something. Um, I saw this. Because remember, you're basically reporting this to the police. Consider this. This way to look at this is you are reporting to the police that you saw something going on that you think is weird. Okay? That is literally what this box is. You are saying, hey, guys, this may or may not be. I may see something. I may not. But I just want you to know it. Okay? There may be something here. There may not. You may not even have all the information. Think about it. Remember, were you, were you required to collect his information? He's below $10,000. Did you have to collect his driver's license and all that stuff? No. Nope. So you had to just uh, more or less collect what information you have, the transactions, and put it down in the comments and kind of say what was going on and tell them what your suspicion was. And you submit it. And you, ironically, have Bob White here. And you go, hey, I just wanted you guys to know, I see this guy, it may be nothing, you know, whatever. And you're putting this in the comments going, I have a customer who on this date, this date, and this date, um, brought in currency to purchase overall during this period of time, $16,000 of, you know, marijuana. I just wanted to report this to you because I believe it may be a suspicious transaction. Okay. Now, this guy over here happened to also see the same thing. You know, it's kind of weird. I just, I don't think this guy is smoking $12,000 worth of marijuana. All right. Just by chance. I don't think he's doing this. So what happens is these guys didn't bother seeing it, even though they have their 4,000 whatever here, just the same things here. They have the same columns of dollars. They just didn't see it, right? Um, so if you total it up, that these will have all the same kinds of large transactions through all these periods, but they didn't see it, these four other guys here. But these two happened to just report it, the suspicious transaction. And so what happens is these two, which got reported, and checked as a SARS. These will then go as a SARS report, a SARS, suspicious activity reports. That is what then gets looked at. What happens then is FENCEN, then, and they're the police, FENCEN looks at that and guess what they discover? He's he, uh, selling 
<laughs> interstate <laughs> drug dealer. <laughs> Mm-hmm. or whatever it may be whatever he was because what he's doing is he's just did it ever get reported normally okay did it, i mean think about it was it going to be reported did, was it required to be reported here 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 no no, no. was it required here, here? no the ten thousand dollar amount was never required by any of these guys but on the 8300 and it's it's very important that you understand this because it's part of that report is you are required even though it says cash report of cash payments over ten thousand dollars received in a trade or business that's the name of the report there is kind of unless okay unless there's suspicious activity. And then what happens is, is these guys saw that by chance, I'm just letting you know that I happened to see this guy doing something. And as a report, SAR, uh, FinCEN put it together, and these are SARS report. These are SARS is what they're called, suspicious activity reports. Um they put it together and can realize that that was an interstate drug dealer. He was taking the large amounts of, of marijuana, uh, breaking it up and reselling it to other States, you know, just buying it up in multiple places. Cause would you see it? He's buying it at multiple places for below the $10,000, but he's walking in there with large amounts of cash, buying up, you know, reasonable amounts, $4,000, $3,000. But because he's doing, you know, fairly large amounts on a regular basis, which no person, I mean, think about it. Are you going to go smoke $16,000 worth of marijuana, hopefully, in a week? God, I hope not. You must be throwing some unbelievable parties. Um, you know, I mean, on a regular basis and doing this week after week, I mean, they may see this, see this, you know, after two, three weeks, they may see this and say, this is something that I'm just seeing is wrong, something like this. And that's what the SARS portion is. And that's, that's a suspicious transaction. And again, like I said, what we're doing is that's where this section is different than an individual okay that's that's why i said this form the 8300 is for businesses and that's where the law is change is different than for an individual they expect businesses to be their eyes and ears and to work together to prevent certain things, crimes, because the businesses can be used to do things that an individual typically can't, okay, because of their size. So as a result, they've put these into, into place, all right? Does that make sense as to why they would have this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. I know it sounds like I've kind of drilled this one into you, but there's kind of a reason because this is the one form that all the businesses are required, not optional. They are required to use no matter what they do. Okay. Most never ever have to use it. The only thing that they do have to use it for is if there's a suspicious activity report. Now, what would also be a suspicious activity? Involving money. Because there's one other one that would go on this that, you know, you'd probably kind of, I don't know, it sounds a little strange, but it's an important one. I don't know. Well, you kind of touched on it earlier when we were talking about the $100 bills. Counterfeiting? Thank you. 
Yeah, because I said don't do the hundred dollar <laughs> bills, do the twenty. Don't don't do the counter. Don't do that. All right. How do you counterfeit a, a, a dollar bill? How do you counterfeit money? And what are you require, required to look for? What what are the security Americans. precautions for? What are the let me go, let me go back a step. What are the security precautions if you take a dollar bill out of your pocket? What are kind of the security precautions that are put into U.S. currency the to prevent it? The watermarks and the the type of paper. Type of paper is a big one. That's one of actually the biggest ones. Type of paper, watermark. There's also that strip that goes the through. Strip. The um, <clears throat> well, it's another big, big one. All hundred dollar bills. They write. Uh, they write. Use a pen to write on them to see if it's. Uh, it's a chemical reaction. Yeah. That the brown pen and that goes with the paper. The biggest one is the ink. The ink is a special formulation that is used only by the treasury for the ink itself. I used to work for a company that manufactured um, counterfeit bill detectors. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Okay. Yeah, well, because when we're testing them. We had to not only have regular bills that we would go to the bank to get, so we we test different currencies at different dates at different times, um, because each of them are different. Di everything is a little different in each batch. Uh -huh. So the, the machine had to detect each of those. And not only that, but we had to have... Um, counterfeit bills in order to test if it was if it was able to see it yeah yeah um here's a neat thing that you guys may or may not know uh remember in the past and this is for anybody i don't know anybody who's been here i don't, actually i don't think any of you guys have been here to know this really um you know because we've scanned currency in the past right to put it into the documents when somebody pays in, in currency, I know James has tried to do this a lot in the South, and I told people up here, uh, don't worry about it. And there's a reason I told people don't worry about it up here. Do you know what that reason is? You're not supposed to photocopy money. Uh, it gets even worse than that. What happens if you try to photocopy on the Lexmarks? I don't know. Oh, it's illegal. It's illegal. It's illegal to do. And what does the Lexmarks do? It photocopies in color. Mm, the Lexmarks actually have a currency reader in them. When you try to read money, it stops. It actually, on the Lexmarks, it'll say currency, uh, currency uh, attempting to be, uh, I can't remember exactly what it says word for it, but it, it will actually shut itself down and say, cannot complete this uh, copy. This is a currency, this is US currency or whatever it is. It, it recognizes the dollar bills. Yeah. It knows its yep. currency. It, it will shut itself off. It will not make the copies. You can't copy it to try to scan the money. The new copiers will actually recognize that it's currency. It will not let you do it. It will not let you scan it into the documents. The old scanners would actually let you do it. And I mean, I've got some high-end scanners, old ones, that will scan currency to the point that it's like you could have a hard... And with some of my high-end laser printers... They could look pretty real. Oh, yeah. The texture may be a little weird, and the laser printers don't print it the same way, but you could get some pretty real-looking bills here. Back in the but, day, the government was uh, reluctant to put color into printers because they were afraid of people. Counterfeiting them. Yep. So, Sheila and Gary, you picked on two major things to try to prevent that. Actually, the ink is the third one but there's a strip in it in the paper. The special U.S. currency is actually not paper. Most people yes. don't realize that. It it's actually, cloth. it's cloth. It's actually a cotton blend, special cotton blend for U.S. currency. If you look at it and you hold it up close, it's actually got other color fibers in it. It's special for U.S. currency. And it's designed, ironically, to react to those pens that you guys are talking about to react with pens when you go across them and it makes a strip. If you go across regular paper with those pens, it won't change color. If you go across currency, it'll change color so you can actually tell that it's real currency. It'll react with the paper. And then that strip in it, that strip is a holographic strip. So if you hold it up, it's actually a piece of, the, the paper is actually two pieces of paper 
glued together for the money. The, the, the two pieces of inside and outside cloth with that piece of holographic plastic strip stuck between it. So it's, if you run your finger across it, you can actually feel that there's a strip there, that there's actually something in the bill. That strip is actually placed between, sandwiched between the front and back uh, pages of the money. So it has more than one. So what happens when you got a guy who comes in and, and there's a, oh, there is another major, major, major important thing on every U.S. dollar bill. Know what it is? Well, Every a what's that? Got a number. Serial number. Thank you, Sheila. You are brilliant. Thank you. Every U.S. dollar bill has a unique serial number. There's only one. There aren't two anywhere that have that same serial number. Okay. Everyone has its mint location. And it's serial number. It says exactly where it was made and the number. So it can be tracked. And uh, when counterfeiters, how do counterfeiters counterfeit money? Have they got the, oh, excuse me, garbage trucks going by. Oh, yeah. It's garbage day, so. Which is a good thing. It'll get, it'll it's empty okay. my garbage. My can. dogs are barking because of your instructions. They get the cars. Uh huh. So, anyways, what do counterfeiters typically not have? They don't usually have a printing press, which will print the dollar bills. I mean, if they do, that's awesome. But that usually doesn't have the unique printer which will print a special serial number on every single bill, a different one. Oh, they have a, a plate that only has one number. Yeah. And that's what ends up happening is, is it has the same serial number over and over and over again. So if a guy comes in or he has just a few plates they've engraved, so when he walks in, okay, they're sequential. Okay, if somebody walks in with a whole bunch of brand new bills that are sequential or just crumpled up bills, ironically enough, they're just a little bit. <laughs> when we talk about laundering money, by the way, uh, counterfeiters have a habit of doing just that. You actually launder money. Do you know what that means? But that's stick it, laundering process. Stick it in the dryer. Yeah. Uh, actually stick it in water so it kind of gets soaks up some of the water a little bit and gets a little soggy and sticks it in the dryer. Why? Because it makes it look used. But what doesn't that change? The serial numbers. If somebody comes in consistently with a whole bunch of bills that ironically are sequential, you're not going to see a whole bunch of sequential bills that look used. Okay? They will have been used. All right? So they'd better be using... Uh, random serial numbers from random places, but if somebody hands you, pays you with like, you know, five $20 bills that look used but have serial numbers that are going one, two, three, four, there's a problem here. <laughs> All right. And if they're, and again, most people at the, and let's be honest, most cashiers are not going to take the time to look. All right. That's just being honest. But when things like that happen, that's what the suspicious activity report is for. Things that are out of the ordinary. Somebody walks in with a whole stack of brand new $20 bills and starts paying you with them. And they're, ironically enough, looking awfully good and awfully new. Well, maybe they were just at the bank. But if they keep doing it, you know, every few days... And always paying you with new $20 bills, that might be a problem. Okay? Because it's hard to launder money, ironically enough. If you're counterfeiting, I can imagine how hard it would be to continuously run laundered loads of $20 counterfeit money to try to get them to look used. And while our treasury can do it, I'm sure an individual in his house, that's going to be hard to do. And they're going to get tired of doing it and they're going to start trying to use and use newer bills and 
that's what the SARS report is for. Something where it's out of the ordinary, something that happened that says, wait a minute, and it doesn't feel right. Okay, we had, uh, believe it or not, and this is truth, there was a series of ironically counterfeit $20 bills going around um, part of Clark County and Cowlitz County. They were trying to go to small stores and cash them in. I don't know what the results were, but there were reports of it. Uh, the notice went around that people were trying to send to do counterfeit bills and the warning went out to the local businesses and the casino and all. Cause that's what the, the, we have, for those who don't know, we actually have one, two, three, four casinos here. Okay. Three of them are card rooms and one mega casino. Okay. The three card rooms do just card games i can't have the slots but they have all the regular table games so they have cash transactions just like the the regular casino so they get the notices as well and they have all the same things as the regular ones they're all in the center and then we have the casino in ridgefield and so all the businesses around them have all the currency that goes through the casinos so they get them all the time they get all the notices for all the businesses so um, cash is a very real thing and people try to counterfeit money through them all the time. And while we think about it that it's just in the movies, it's very real. And people try to do $20 bills, $100 bills, and they try to go in and pay with a $100 bill or actually usually it's a $50 bill in a lot of cases, a 50 or 20s because $100 bills now are checked out a lot more than uh, 50s and 100s are checked for that very reason. So you are right, Lisa. It is the 20 that gets counterfeited the most. Okay. Because it's easier to pass off. People just kind of brush over it. They don't check them. Um, the 100s and 50s get checked the most. But people go in with a $20 bill, buy $2 worth of stuff, and walk out of a store. And they will go to store after store after store and do that and, you know, spend and get the change, which totals up thousands of dollars and thousands of dollars at multiple stores. And that's how they do it. And while it doesn't seem like a lot, when you think the $20 bills, you know, how many $20, it takes five $20 bills to equal hundred dollars. Right. And you're talking about, Oh, the, just the change from it is what you're getting. It can add up really, really fast. Especially if you have a network of people doing it. Yes. Yes. They have an entire group of people doing it and they're out buying little things or they go into a Walmart and they uh, have something that costs like 200 bucks. And in that 200 bucks, 80 of it will be counterfeit bills. And they do mix it in with regular bills because the regular bills um, basically people will glance through and go, Oh, it looks good because the regular bills kind of make you feel secure. You're looking at, Oh, it feels good. You know, and you don't check every single bill. Okay. You just kind of feel through it and Oh, looks, Oh, looks good. Okay. And they just go on and $160. So 80 of it may have been half of it or whatever was counterfeit. You just got $80 worth of counterfeit bills in and you got $180 worth of stuff. And they buy that merchandise and then immediately sell it somewhere else on eBay or uh, Amazon or whatever to sell online on Craigslist. Uh, most Brian, people, yeah. Thank you for giving us all these ideas to start <laughs> organized criminal. <laughs> organized crime. <laughs> I had a client once who had, a, he was a printer and uh -huh. he had his own printing press and he <laughs> actually forged um, certain things that he was found guilty for and i had oh, to testify bad. in the case it was ugly that's bad but like i said the reason i'm i'm emphasizing this is because the businesses this is the one document that separates the two that, that literally is the difference between this document is the biggest difference between a business and an individual individuals do not report this they don't have to. They're not required to by law. Um, if I take, you know, $15,000 in cash and hand it to you for your car, now the bank's going to flip out when you go try to, to stick it into the bank 
So if you hold on to it and just go buy little things individually, no problem. You know, if you got $15,000 in cash and you just, you know, stick it under your mattress and pay for things individually, great. No problem. Nobody cares. You know, never going to get reported. Never going to happen. Nobody's going to bother with you and you don't have to report it. When you go put it into your bank, the bank will report it, by the way. All right. So, I mean, that is the way it works. If you go to take that, I go to you. I've got my saved up cash. I got $15,000 in cash. I go to you, buy your car, buy your TV, buy your whatever, your computer systems, whatever, and give you $15,000 in cash. You don't have to report a thing. Okay? You're an individual. Um, you take that 15000 bucks, and you go buy TV, stereos, next week's groceries, groceries for the next month, whatever you want to do. Does it matter? No. Okay? But if you go take it and try to stick it in the bank as 15000 bucks, it will get reported. If you go to the bank and put in 2000 8000 you know, whatever it is, individually it was spread over a couple of weeks guess what you got fifteen thousand dollars in the bank and no one knows okay doesn't get reported but if you go and buy something for ten thousand dollars then they'll report it as you whatever exactly if you go to a business and do it that's the difference and that is the biggest difference you need to understand if you go to an individual and pay that ten thousand dollars or more it doesn't get reported if you go to any institution give them ten thousand dollars it's going to get reported any type of business it gets reported and it can be the wire transfer it can be the traveler's checks it can be the cash and very soon it will probably be cryptocurrency but that's not official yet so don't worry about that one okay because that one's harder to track so that's what you need to know about the 8300. And you have to understand, because this is, again, back to business reporting. This is not just what needs to go at tax time, because this is actually what businesses need to understand for their business accounting. You need to keep that log throughout the day. They need to keep that log for that exact reason. What I was saying is, you know, shift one had... Eh, below ten thousand dollars. Did I care? No, nope, didn't have to file anything. But they came in later after I was off for the day and bought another six thousand dollars worth. They're now at fifteen thousand dollars for that day. You have to keep that log for your businesses for that day. And then also, if it's suspicious, if they've doing doing this over and over, they're below the ten thousand dollar amount. You've never reported them because they're always below the $10,000 amount, but they're doing this over and over and over and over. And you're going, or something about what they did was weird. They bought something that you knew had a high value. And instead of saying, well, here's my, here's my bank card, you know, here's my debit card. I want to get this and putting on my debit card, they walked in with $8,000 in cash. You know, it's like I said, buying the guy's car with $15,000 in cash. You walk into the car dealership, let me put it that way, you walk into the car dealership and you do, you do the, the, the Scarface thing where he walks in and says, I want that car with this, the, the scanners and I want that and I want the, the, the things seated to the police, I want that car and pays cash for it, okay? That would be suspicious, okay? That would be suspicious because even if it was only $8,000, okay? Do you report it? No, it's under, it's under $10,000. Technically, you don't report it. But the guy walked in with $8,000 in small crumpled bills and just paid for a new car, okay? That's suspicious. That's not something that you would see on a regular basis. That's not something that that happens in the ordinary world. And that's saying, okay, this guy walked in with something that I just don't know how to explain. I just want you to know it. The reason is, is that may lead them back to, they, they may see it's nothing. It may be nothing. He may just be eccentric and really strange. Okay. 
but it may lead them back to a guy who's <laughs> a drug dealer who's just buying a car that he wants, okay, with illegal money. He may have just won – he may be a guy who just won a whole bunch of cash at the casino and is now, you know, blowing it to impress a girl. All right? He may be that. And if they can show that, oh, yes, he just won $20,000 at the casino or he won, he won a $100,000 jackpot and he's just blowing it. Okay, great. He's got $100,000 in cash. He just went out and bought a new car in cash. Okay, why he would ever do that, I have no idea. I don't think I would want to carry $100,000 in cash around with me or something like that. But it does happen. Some people think that would be really cool to do. Okay. That is out of the ordinary. That's what that suspicious activity report is meant for. And it's that same form. And that is saying, here's anything that is out of the ordinary. Because that's what that whole form is. Think about it. The form 8300, what are you doing when you're reporting $10,000 in a single business day? What are they trying to find? Illegal activity, right? Mm -hmm. What does that suspicious activity mean? Something that you think may be illegal activity. So even though it's not the $10,000 mark, it's something that stuck out to you that's going, hey, um, this person, I need you to kind of pay attention, okay? If they get enough of those suspicious activity reports on just one person, then they're really they pay attention to it. Exactly. That's why I said you get some guy who, oddly enough, is buying marijuana in large quantities on a regular basis from multiple stores, and it's coming in, and they go, hey, guys, not that it's important, but our computer just put together that within this area, and that's what will happen. Remember, these are computerized. They're electronic. That's why they have to be e-filed, because these go into a central database, which in the database then analyzes those numbers and says, hey, um, over the past six months, I got a report that says that this person, Bob White, we don't have much more information on him. You know, we have a couple people who actually were able to get an ID from him, a partial ID or something, shows that he's made multiple purchases at different locations for large amounts. I think we need to look into him. And what will happen is then he will they will then begin an investigation just to see if it's, it may be he's perfectly, maybe he's wild at parties and just literally has incredible parties. Okay. And just has lots of weed laying out, but it may be that he's actually doing drug deals. And as a result, they may find it because these guys reported it. And that's what the suspicious activities is. So, and again, like I said, when we're, when we're talking about that, this is the difference between what the business reporting is and what the um, individual taxes are. See, when we talk about an individual, what do they normally keep for their records? Some okay, receipts. Okay, record. Yeah, a couple of receipts, things that happen stuff throughout the year. They think, oh, I might be able to deduct this off my taxes, donations, a couple of things like that, right? But a business has to keep regular records. All right? So let's do this. It's 1250. Let's take a 10 minute break because it's good for a bathroom break or something. Okay, sound good? Yeah, and then good. I'm And I'm gonna get off the 8300 now. No more on it. You guys know more about it than most people alive. Very true. Okay. So we're done with it. You guys now understand all you need to for the test. All right. Okay. So take okay. 10 minutes and we'll get, come back to it. All right. Bye.
pretty baby. She's a pretty baby. What a pretty kitty.
All right. Now, I know this is going to sound weird, but you guys all know what these forms are, okay? But the forms are all known to you guys from the person side because that's the way we all know them. Um, we know them because we've all filled them out, okay? We know what they are because we've sent them off. We've had to fill them out to go to work. We've filled them out to, to uh, file our taxes. We've gotten them from our, our jobs, that sort of thing. But the difference is there's another side to them, and that's the business side, the people who actually supplied the forms and how they got processed on the other side. And that's what we have to understand for this part. 
And I know it sounds a little strange because you're just like, well, I already know these forms. But we need to know where they go on this on the business side instead of the individual side. Okay. So we're going to cover them. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because, like I said, you have dealt with them. Um, the W-9 form is pretty simple. When you have it, the W-9 just basically identifies who you are. Now, the problem is for an employee, it's pretty simple. For a business, it's a whole lot different. Um, you have no idea how much of a headache this form is. Um, the W-9, and it's also called an I-9 in a sense, okay, they, they identify it as an I-9, is an identification form W-9. Um, so a lot of places just refer to it as an I-9. What is the I-9 doing? Um, it identifies the employee's social security number. It's pretty much all you're doing is you're recognizing what the employee's social security number is so it can be reported to the IRS. And that's the important part. Who does it get reported to and how does it get reported? Now, when you get it, the W-9 has to have a couple of things with it. Anybody know what they are? Identification and social security number. Right on. Anybody know what those identifications have to be? A state issued ID or a passport. Ah, you're just about there. It's kind of, it's a little bit broader than that. Government you're, you're right on. ID, I think. There you go. Government. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. What it is, is it has to be one of two things. There's actually what's called, and it falls under, insanely enough, two different categories. You have, and it's called, literally, category A and category B. So let's actually do this again. Let me pull up. We're going to pull up. A W-9, because it's going to make a whole lot more sense if we see it. Now, honestly, this thing, it looks simple. It's not. And it's not, uh, it's because mainly that it's not, uh, I've had to do the business side of the I-9s before when I was working in human resources. Let me go through here and make sure this has the stuff here. Yeah, this should basically say what we're looking for. When you're in human resources, again, like you said, this is perfect because human resources is the backside area that we're kind of talking about. And I'm going to share this part. Okay, can you guys see that one? That is the I-9, or the W-9. Request for taxpayer identification. Now, what you're looking for is you're just basically saying who the person is. Now, pretty simple, you figure, right? Who am I? It's saying the name, if it's a business, identifying it as a business, because it can be an, an EIN number, it could be a, a business, because that does apply. But it'll ask, if it is a business, who are you? Okay, you know, it's like, are you a partnership? Are you a C-Corp? that sort of thing, and where do you reside, and the form is actually really short, by the way, <laughs> there's nothing on the form, okay, list of account numbers, requester's name, city, state, account, and then the number, and that's all the form actually is, okay, and then you sign it, and date it. The problem is how you identify it. What that means is you have to then go through and compare some numbers to make sure it's valid. 
And what that means is you end up with the I-9 certification. Now, you have to show a couple of things. And this is just what it is here, and it's pretty simple. There's nothing really complicated with this form because, as you can see, there's nothing to the form. But with this, you have to show certain things. You have to show, and let me see if I have it up here, if I can pull this up. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up as an I-9 form. Let me see if this is the employment certification. Employment verification. Let me see if I can pull it up this way. Because we actually have to verify it. This is kind of how we support that form. Let's see if it comes up here. Right. Okay, it's just not responding. That was helpful. All right, it doesn't like us that way. All right, I was hoping I could bring this up so I could actually show you what it actually wants. But once this is done, you actually do have to pull up and compare it to existing forms. So we're going to stop this here. I'm just going to see if I can pull it up here. Uh, maybe I can. Nope. It's just tied up. Okay. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to stop that one. And I'm just going to put this. Okay. We're just going to go back to this one. Okay. Sorry about that. I was hoping I could show you the form. But anyways, what it has is a list of forms which are considered acceptable. And they are in two different groups, group A and group B, literally. And you have to have one from group A, which is actually pretty much just one document. It's a passport. That's one of the only things they will, that is the only thing they will accept for group A. Um, the passport means it is a, a valid, certified, and here's the most important one by valid non-expired passport. If you have an expired passport, you can't just say, I'm gonna go get it replaced. That unfortunately is one of the things that kills us most. Some people will say, oh, my passport just expired. I gotta go get a replacement one. Guess what? It does not count. You cannot have an expired passport. Hello? If it's expired, it's considered uh, not acceptable. Um, or a driver's license, you know, state issued driver's license and a state issued so and a social security administered, um, and it has to be social security administration issued SSA card. Now here's the important thing. And you have to have this really, really, this is one of the most, it has to be an original. Now, I know that sounds really strange, but it has to be an original one. They will not accept a uh, photocopy or anything like that. You have to see the original card. And, you know, those neat people who go, well, the Social Security Administration, the SSA card, is just, remember, it's a flimsy little paper card, right? So some people have kind of decided, well, I just want to keep it so it doesn't, nothing happens to it. Oh, no lamination. Thank you. <laughs> they, oh, I sent the, I sent the I-9, the employer part of the I-9 in the chat. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was, uh, that's what I was trying to get on short notice here. And I didn't think to pull it up for you. Thank you. That is awesome. That was what I was trying to pull up. And the thing is, is the most important 
lots of people want to protect a social security card. So what do they do? They laminate it. Guess what that just did to your, your card? Invalidated it. You no longer have a social security card. Now you um, have to go to the office and deal with them. Yep. You have to go back and you have to literally um, <laughs> change the card and you need to uh, get the replacement card and all. I know that that sounds bad, but it is true. You actually have to get a new card. I know most people are going, what are you talking about? You have to get a new card. All I did was laminate it. It made the card an invalid card. You actually changed the card. And I know it sounds bad, but you changed a government card. And you're just like, what do you mean? You just changed a government ID. You have basically falsified a government ID. And as bad as it sounds, you just made it so that you cannot uh, use it. Oh, thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Let me pull this up here. And I will share that one. Thank you, Lisa. There we go. Now you guys can see this. There's list A, list B, and list C. And what it means, if you have a passport, a U.S. passport or a U.S. passport card, these are the only ones which, with and employment authorization, these are the important ones, the foreign passport, the passport from one of these countries, and this is the only ones that count, by the way, only ones that count, these are allowable. These you need to have one from each category. Okay, this is a single one you need from list A or one from list B and C. That's why the and is here. So, so what happens is this establishes both a U.S. passport, which allows you to work and uh, be, uh, be here. And this is a permanent resident card or alien resident uh, receipt card, which allows you to work here. Um, which allows you to work here and establishes your identity, or you need to have an individual one, which is the driver's license, and typically, uh, where we heard the social security uh, account number, and that will have everything unless it says not valid for employment um, or valid for work with like DHS authorization, this thing. Okay because that actually makes it really limited because you have to have this is the valid for the, this establishes your identity and this is establishes your work your work ability. And these are some of the things that are important. All of these, except for basically this one, the voter registration card, typically does not have a photo on it, but some of them now even do have a photo on it. These are a photo government ID card. See this one? School ID card with a photograph. If it doesn't have a photograph, it doesn't count. Um, military dependence ID card usually have a photograph on them. Now, this one's a little bit different. The Native American tribal document usually do not have a photograph on them, but they'll, they will accept that. And then this one, this one is the only exception um, is if you're under 18 and you have you know, unable to produce one of these, they will accept this. But if you're working, you know, I don't know exactly what you're doing here to, you know, you're 16 years old, I suppose, but you would have, have to typically have a driver's license or something because you're getting to work. Yeah, and a school ID. A school I mean, ID. 16 year old would have a school ID. Typically, yeah. So, you know, that's that's what I'm saying. You're normally not going to have one of these you're typically going to have normally one of these, an ID card. You know, if you don't drive, you still usually have a state ID card, that sort of thing. And then this is the important one um, <laughs> where it says you can work. And this is the important thing. That's social security number. And that's what I said about the card is the most important thing. Most people do not get it. 
I mean, think about it. I have my original card, which is really strange. I actually have my original card, which means it's worn around the edges. I got it when I was 16, 15, 15, something like that. So I've had it for a few years. We're not going to discuss how long. A um, lot of years there. Anyway, so it started to wear out when it was in my wallet for years. And after a while, I realized, because I knew that it, it, it invalidates it if I laminate it. So I actually took, remember those uh, plastic baseball card holders, the ones that are basically a sleeve for the baseball card? I just slipped it in it, knowing that it doesn't do anything. I can just pull it right back out. It's just holding it in there. Um, do not let them laminate it. And remember something, you are on the business side now. You have to think about it in these terms now. On the business side, it does not count. It literally invalidates it if they have laminated it. And a lot of them just out of the goodness of their heart, you know, they laminate it and they don't realize that they have just killed themselves. They have to go get a new card and we cannot accept it. And the problem with our system even is for, for us, specifically for Jackson Hewitt, we actually have to submit and certify that we have held the original documents and submit that to the I-9 stuff, which then, here's the important part. Let me go back to this, this screen here. When I talk about where does it go, okay, where does this information get sent to? This Form W-9 gets sent to two places. It gets sent to the IRS and to the Social Security, uh, to the Social Security Administration and it gets compared to their database for validity. In other words, that social security number matches up with the name to make sure that the name is the right name for that social security number. Because let's say somebody is stealing social security numbers to use it so they can work. They usually don't use the owner's name. They're gonna try to use their name, you know. And they're going to try to, to use a name to hide the ID that they're, that they're using. And their database will compare it and it'll come back with an error if it's a wrong name. And it'll kick it out and say they can't work for us. Businesses are often required, are really supposed to now be using this. Um, now again, like I said, we're seeing this from the business aspect. It's not so much from, we're used to seeing it from the other side, but we gotta see it from this side now, from the business side. So this is really important because what you're doing is you're making sure that that person is not just uh, going to work from you for you, but can work for you. And there are penalties if they can't. If you let them go to work for you, there are penalties for you as a business for allowing them to work for you. All right. The W-7. Uh, and This is an important form. It's more for people who, on the business side, can work. They have the certification to work, in a sense. They have a, a letter that says they are allowed to work in the United States, but they have not yet received the Social Security number. Okay. This will also be especially important for what reason? Anybody have an idea? Let's say I go to work um, at this firm and my wife doesn't have a social security number. This is a tax identification number, which my wife did have for a little while. My wife actually had, an, uh, had a, a, a TIN number instead of a social security number when she first came to the States. And why would that be really, really important when I work here and she couldn't work yet? Can file jointly. I get benefits. Benefit. See that. I right get there. right there. I get benefits. I have benefits that I get from my employer that have to go to a specific person. Well, she doesn't have her social security number yet. Okay. When she doesn't, or what's that social security number? That's her ID number for the world to the United States. Her social security number is her ID, which says that's who I am. And if she doesn't have it yet, we got to give her a temporary number. So 
that is her temporary number to the world, which says, this is who I am. Okay. So when I get my benefits, she still has to have it. Or let's say, again, I have benefits for dependents and I'm think about this and we're trying to figure this one out because I technically can't do it yet. Remember I was just describing this little monster who's over in the Philippines. Okay. Uh -huh. She lives, she lives at my house in the Philippines. Um, I support her in every way. I take care of her in every way. Um, the house is mine. Um, you know, shells and my shells in mine. Uh, we send her food. We send her everything. She is, she carries our name. God, I hope we do. You know, um, we're about to celebrate her birthday in a few days and we're going to actually have a video link between here and the Philippines to celebrate her birthday with her. Um, what does that make her? Well, for all intents and purposes, Your daughter, Your <laughs> my child. daughter, it's what she is. That's my baby girl. Okay. But for tax terms and for things like who she is, what does that make her? A dependent. Thank you. Does she have a social security number? Wouldn't she get an A-10? Well, we'd have to work on what she would technically get, oh, but right. but for for all intents and purposes, um, we, she would have some type of tax identification number. Um, but for this, we have to, for her benefits, we would have to get her some form of tax identification number to identify who she is in regards to my benefits and Shell's benefits. Um, so that, and God forbid, something happens and we both of us have life insurance. We're driving together and she, you know, Shell's got her Mustang convertible, okay? God forbid something happens to us. Who do those benefits go to if something, if something happens and we're both gone? Okay. Who do those benefits go to? I know exactly who I want them to go to. I want to make sure that our baby girl that Rihanna is taken care of. Okay, so who do those benefits go to? The person over there. So I want a way, to, a way for them to be identified so that she has a number. So she will need some type of tax identification number, something that identifies who she is. And whether that's, like I said, whether that's an A-10 or whatever, you know, but some type of number which identifies who she is and that she's my dependent. Um. So that's what the W-7 would be. Typically, this would be something for an immediate family member for your taxes where it's your wife and that sort of thing or a family member for your taxes. But this is also for employee benefits and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. okay, for, for dependents to identify. <clears throat> okay. The W-4. Now, the W-4 is really pretty simple, okay, but it's a whole lot different from the business side, when you're filling out your W-4, what do you do? You kind of just mark the form because it just says your tax exempt amounts. I want, well, frankly, I just want to be exempt. <laughs> you know, I just want to say, okay, I don't want to owe any tax. I just want everything to come to me, right? But from the business aspect, where does it go? You have to file that with the IRS. You have to withhold those amounts, okay, and calculate for those employee records. Because remember now, Here's an important thing. All of the information that I'm currently giving you has to go where? IRS. No, I'm thinking more, more locally. Instead of the IRS, I'm thinking your business. Employer. What do you, has to be their employer records. You have to keep an entire set of. HR. <laughs> HR. There you go. Thank you. HR has to keep an entire set of employee records, including their payroll, their exemption amounts, their dependents, their anything like this, because all of them are affected by these forms. Okay. So on the business side, remember, all of these forms are different from the way you think about them, because <laughs> from the employee side, what do you do with the W-4? I filled it out. I signed it. I gave it to the guy, Right. Now what happens to it? Now you actually have to take and do something with it because a form isn't just now a form. It's now 
that's the employees withholding. That is what you report to the IRS. That is what now goes to HR. That is what now goes to payroll. All right, because all that gets affected by it. So I know that some people just think, oh, well, it's just a W-4 form. You have to now think about it. Because again, like I said, you're shifting your brain now. That's why I didn't want to get into this so much until you guys were ready to take your test because I'm about to shift your brain from that side to this side. All right. You're going to be shifting now from I'm thinking about the person to I'm now thinking about the business. It's a whole different world. You're just thinking about it from the other side. Um, so those W-4 forms all of a sudden mean a whole lot different. So now you're thinking about your payroll, your exemptions, how much you're paying in taxes. Now, what does that affect on what you're doing for your exempt amounts? Where does that go for the taxes? I'm a business, so I'm holding, holding this money out. What do I do? You're a business. <laughs> Come on, Sheila, you know what this one is. Remit to... It's your withholding. Thank you, your quarterly withholdings. <laughs> I knew you'd get it. Thank you, dear. So, you have to submit this. You have to pay this, by the way, to the IRS. This is your quarterly withholdings. This amount that you're withholding, think about it, it doesn't stay in your pocket. You're a, you're a business. You know, you got to pay this tax amount to someone. Wouldn't that be cool? You withhold it, you get to spend it as a as a business. Oh well, I just held out of my employees. My employees don't get to keep it, so I do. You know, that'd <clears> be seen that, been there, done that. Wouldn't that be great? Think about that. I just didn't give it to anybody, you know. So that'd be great. But no, unfortunately, we have to give that to the IRS. So we have the quarterly withholding payments that we have to make, and. So when we start thinking about it from that side, these W-4 forms all of a sudden take on a whole new life. You have to, and as things go in, things as more W-4s come in, you hire people, people leave. Okay? So people now quit. That changes payroll. That changes what's going to happen, how much you owe. You have to calculate what the exit amounts are, all that, all based on this W-4. And that all affects what the employee, employee benefits are, what they're getting paid, the amounts. These are all part of that. Okay, now, this one sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? W-2. You get a W-2, put it on your taxes, right? We're not thinking about it from that side. We've got to think about it from the other side. It's just the income reporting of employees. But what is this to you? This W-2 is what to you? You're a business now. You're not a person. This is not an income to you now. It's an expense. Thank you, Sheila. You are so awesome. This W-2 is your reporting to the outside world in a sense. This is your receipt, if you want to think about it that way. This is your receipt for the expense of your employees. These W-2s, you're paying those employees for their work. So you are reporting that outward funds. This is an expense to you. So it's no longer in that sense. This is not an income to you. <clears throat> okay. This W-2 is your outward flow of funds to your employees. Okay. This is payroll and how much it is. That sum on those W-2s that you just sent out is your outward expense to things like Social Security to your uh, uh, IRAs, to all the, everything that you've paid out for those employees, those are all of your outward expenses for your labor, okay? And that's majorly important. That's the outward expenses for those things. So you have to keep track of all of that, which you will have anyways within your record keeping. Um, it will be uh, reported to, oh, hang on a second, my phone's ringing again. I apologize here. So anyways, it is an outward expense to you as a business in place of you thinking of the W-2 when you think about it as a person 
as an individual, the W-2, the W-2 is your inward income when you're thinking about it as an individual. The W-2 is actually your outward expenses when you're on the business side. Makes it a little more confusing, but that's actually what it is. Now, that's the important thing about it. When do you have to have it out? January 31st. I clicked on it beforehand. I should have clicked after I nope. asked the question. But <laughs> <laughs> why do you have to have it by January 31st of the following year? Because that's when you have to send out the W. Whatever. That's when you file for your fourth quarter. Thank you. Because that's when you have to report your fourth quarter uh, earnings, profit or loss. And you have to give your employees time because you're, you're a business now. You're not thinking about it from the persons. For, the, for your employees, you're thinking about it from your business side. That is your reporting for your fourth quarter earnings for the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because think about it. What happened? When does your fourth quarter end? Sheila? Fourth quarter ends on the 31st of December. Thank you. 31st of December. So you've got one month to calculate everything and report it. And you have to get it all out at the same time you report it to everybody. So end of the fourth quarter reporting, you have to also report everything for the summation for the year to your employees. That's why you actually have to have by the 31st. All of your reporting has to be completed by the end of the fourth quarter. See, you guys, you learned something business now. Did you notice that? Now you start to understand. There's not just the thinking. You have to shift your thinking a little bit. See, so you were thinking, so I could file my taxes, so I could do whatever. It's not working that way. It's because it's the end of the fourth quarter. I have to report to my shareholders what my profit and loss was, what my fourth quarter earnings were, and all that. So I have to be able to calculate that. I do that by saying, here's what all of my income was, here are what my expenses were, and what are the W-2s for that year? Sheila said it earlier. Expense. Those are your expenses for the year. Okay, that's a summation of your labor expenses for the year. Well, for your employee labor expenses for the year. We'll put it that way, because you can also have 1099 stuff, which we'll be getting into in a second. So, Remember, this is the this is the mind shift. This is why I was why I didn't want to do this earlier because I know you guys are taking the test here. But this is the mind shift that you have to do, and I know it's a little bit hard. You have to start making the mind shift now from the individual to the business. You're now going to start thinking. You're, you guys are going to wake up in the middle of the night going, "What quarter is it?" <laughs> okay, it'll be scary. You know, you'll wake up going, "Oh my God, it's the end of the year." You know. It won't be, do I have to file my taxes? Like, did I do my quarterlies? Okay. So you'll start thinking that way. So January 31st is the reporting deadline for your fourth quarter earnings. That's why you have to have these out by then. That's the actual reason. Now you start thinking about it from the business aspect. Okay. That's why I said this W-2 means a whole lot different now to you. And I know it's confusing. That's why I'm taking this slow. I'm not going to, I'm letting you shift. <laughs> so the calendar year ends December 31st. Fourth quarter ends December 31st. It's an important date. So you have to report it usually the following, the end of the following month at the end of each quarter. So Sheila, trivia question. Okay. Here you go. This is for you because you should be able to tell us what are, what's the date for the end of the first quarter on a calendar year? <clears throat> the date for the end of the calendar year that you have to report on? No, just the, the, first, the you know, like December 31st, we know. Right. December 31st is the end of the fourth quarter. Right. What's the end of the first quarter? Oh, well. Usually on a calendar year. March 31st. March 31st. But the reporting date wouldn't be until the following 15th of the following month. Okay, so well, what would that be? So that would be April, April 15th. 15th. April. Now, you notice that important date. April 15th. What is that day? 
It's also tax day for everybody else. Tax day for everybody else. Why do you think they fall on the same day? See, they're st now you guys will start understanding dates. I'm doing this intentionally so you guys can start making that shift. So the end of the first quarter is March 31st, and it's reported April 15th. Oh, yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Do I hear that aha? Uh -huh? Oh, gee, okay. So what's the next one? What's the second quarter? Uh, the end of the, the second quarter is June 30th. June 30th. And when's the reporting date? July 15th. July 15th. Oh, you are so good. And the third quarter? Uh, it would be September 30th. And okay. And here's the important one. Oh, wow. Does anybody know what October 15th is? It is an extension. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are so awesome. You guys hit it out of the ballpark. Did you hear that? Now, do you guys know why those dates exist now? You guys are so awesome. I mean, you guys are so awesome. So, when you think about those numbers, do you ever have to now try to remember what the reporting date is for the first quarter? What is the reporting date for the first quarter? April 15th. Thank you. What is the reporting date for the third quarter? July 15th. October 15th. What is the reporting date for the fourth quarter? October 15th. No, 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 no. For the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter is a... January 31st. January. <laughs> when you get your forms, when you get your W-2s. Every one of these... <laughs> every one of these coincide with specific dates, the same dates we have our individual taxes. You see? They're all... They're all linked. As a matter of fact, the only thing I can't figure out is how we got July 30th and July 15th, because there are... On the individual one, it just happens to be the middle of the year, I suppose. But, no, I mean, because that's no important date in regards to taxes, you know, so on the individual side. But you correspond the individual taxes. Here we go. Individual taxes. What is the filing deadline? April 15. With the extension, what is the deadline? October 15. When do you get your W-2s? January 31st. What is the end of the first quarter? Or when the reporting date? January 31st. No, no, no. What's the end March, of the first quarter? March 30th. April 15th. April 15th. What is the uh, reporting date for the third quarter? <laughs> October 15th. What is the, when do you get your W-2s? <laughs> January 31st. Look at that. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> I am not kidding. Did you guys just memorize the entire list of every reporting date for the quarters? Um, now, tell me that you guys can't do this. I know you guys can. You guys are brilliant. You guys just rattled off literally the reporting date for the entire calendar year for businesses. I am so proud of you. Now, do you understand why they have those dates? Yep. And why we file on those dates and why we do stuff on those dates. You now know more than like literally 99.9% .9 of the population of the, of the, well, the planet more or less on that sense. Congratulations guys. That was awesome. And Sheila. Yes. You were incredible. Thank, Thank you. you. You name those off awesomely. And remember, it's the 15th of the next month. So when I say April 15th, you know, it's March 31st. You just go back to whatever is June 15th, June, I mean, July 15th, June 30th, you know, it's just the end of the next of the month before. So when I ask, when does the quarter end? You just know it's, Oh, that month, the end of the month right there. So if I ask you April 15th, what's it going to be? Two things. So the when filing I say eight, deadline for individual and also the filing deadline for the uh, first quarter. Reporting. And right. when did its quarter end? All you got to do is just kind of fall back what March month was right before it. March 31st, when, we, when the quarter ended, was just right before it. Whatever that, the last day of the month before it. So if it's April, what's the month before April? March. March. 
the last day of March is March 31st. Oh, good. Look at that. <laughs> okay. And if I say October 15th was the third quarter, and we also know that's the extension deadline for an individual. So when was the end of the third quarter? Yeah, we just kind of fall back September 30th. Oh, look at that. And we say, when did we knew, when did we get our W-2s? January 31st. When was the end of the reporting quarter for the fourth quarter? January 31st. Oh, when is the end, when is the end of the fourth quarter? We fall back. Oh, it's December 31st. Oh, look at that. You guys now know everything there is to know about the calendar year in that sense, reporting deadlines. The only one is what falls in the middle of the year because there is no common – I can't think of one. Sheila, can you think of one thing that we have to report on July 15th? Nope. Yeah, that's the only one. The second quarter is the center of the year. It literally is the center of the year. June 30th, okay? It's six months. What is six months? June 30th. What is the center of the year? June 30th, July 15th. That's it. We don't have a corresponding individual thing with it but because it's the center of the year, but that is the, think about it that way to memorize it. What is the center of the year? What is the last day of six months? What is the very center of the year? June 30th, July 1st, June 30th, right there. That's where the year cuts in half. And so it's the 15th of the next month. So you've got July 15th and June 30th. You guys just got every reporting date and deadline based on, all the dates you already know. That's why, congratulations, you just learned them all. How does that feel? I think that's pretty good compared to most people. How does that feel, guys? Every one you just memorized. That's awesome. Okay. All right. Now, let's go on a little bit. This one's a little bit stranger. But again, it has the one difference here. Let me, oh, there is one thing here. The important thing about this one is this is income of employees. We covered this a little bit. W-2 is employee income. People who work for you on a regular daily basis, who come into work nine to five, all right? They have a schedule typically. You are paying them typically benefits. This is the one that goes to the people who work for you to do a job, to do something that's temporary, something that they come in, they, they do a bit, and they may work for you more than once, but they typically are not on a schedule. They, you are not normally paying them benefits. I mean, you might be, but typically you aren't. But, and they are, you are not withholding taxes that you can, they can elect to do some, but we're not going to get into that in detail yet. Okay. But a form 1099 is normally income reporting of non-employees. Okay. And again, it's by January 31st of the following year, you really need to have the 1099 out to them. All right. And it's no different than the W-2 in that sense so that they can report their income. Now, but it does have one condition. Anybody know what that condition is? Now, the W-2 employee, I'm working for you at McDonald's, okay? I worked for you for about uh, two days. I couldn't stand this place. I can't work, I hate working at McDonald's. I flip burgers. I cannot stand working at McDonald's. I quit, okay? Am I gonna get a W-2? Yes. Two days, yeah. Two days, yes. I'm going to get a W-2. I did a small job for you. I, I you know, paid me about, you know, I, I, I did some landscaping. Um, you paid me 450 bucks to landscape your front yard and that sort of thing. Am I going to get a 1099? No, because nope. it's under $600. Thank you. That's the major difference. If no matter what I do... On that W-2, I'm getting the W-2, okay? I don't care if I worked for McDonald's for 15 minutes and made 25 bucks or whatever it was, okay? I'm getting a W-2 from McDonald's. 
But with a 1099, it has a limit. It has to be $600 or more in income. That was awesome, guys, by the way. So, and I have to report it to the IRS. All right, Sheila, trivia question again. Yep. When do I report it to the IRS? The 1099 has to be filed by January 31. Is that Thank what you, mean? you. Thank you. But on a regular basis, though, like I'm, I'm going through, um, if I have employees throughout the year that I have, like at the end of the first quarter, mm -hmm. I have... I have had like 50,000. I've have a lot of employees who work for me part time. That's the, I'm a contractor. Okay. And I have a lot of 1099 employees or I have uh, that sort of thing. You know, I have a lot of independent contractors working for me. Should I, do I, or should I report that? Well, if, if they've earned more than $600, then you have to give them a 1099 by January 31 of the following year. Right. But during the, at the end of the first quarter, should I report that to the IRS just for the quarterly expenses? Well, in, in your quarterly, um, yeah. Well, so thank you. That's kind of what I was saying is at the end of each quarter, here, here's what I'm trying to say is for your bookkeeping. Oh yeah. If you, if you have a lot of 1099 employees. Okay. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about you have, you know, one 1099 employee. I'm talking about the actual form 1099. Yeah, right, right, right. I'm, ju I'm just talking about the reporting of it. Thank you. That's what I was trying to, that's what I was trying to clarify. Thank you. Right. Um, so, I mean, you know, you, your, your withholding is based on your income. Your income is based on your profit and loss. Exactly. So it's going to end up in your quarterly withholdings in a right. sense, what you're, what you're showing for your stuff. So, it's going to show up in there as you did have this as an expense in that sense. Because remember what this is. What is a 1099 just like the W-2? What is a W-2 to you as a business? It's an expense. Thank you. The 1099 is your expense. Okay. So you are going to be reporting it in your quarterlies as an expense. Okay. So it is your expense outward for labor. And so you're going to be showing it in a sense as uh, your quarterly earnings or loss. It's going to be part of that quarterly expense. Okay. So no matter what, now here's the important part. Let's say you only did have, you have a lot of them and you have several that are even at the end of the first quarter, you have a bunch of them that are still under, let's say you have a bunch that are 500, you know, you have a bunch that are above 600, but you have still a bunch that are under 500. In the overall expenses, are you going to be reporting that like it's a 1099, even though you're not giving them 1099s yet? You're going to be treating that like it's an employee expense, correct? Sure. Exactly. Thank you. That's what I was trying to get at. You're going to be treating it, even though it's below the $600 mark, you're still going to be reporting it in your quarterly, like in the first quarter. And I know that sounds a little confusing. I'll get into it a little more detail when we start showing the profit and loss statements. Um, Cause we're going to show it as a quarterly and as a, a yearly, I was going to get into that in a little more detail. So, cause that's the next statement, but you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here cause we're already at two o'clock. Um, cause I don't want to get into the profit and loss statement cause that takes a whole lot more. All right, so we're going to cut it okay. as the end today because um, it's already 2 o'clock. I want you guys to know that was awesome. Now you actually do see that they do correspond. You see why the dates are <clears throat> the dates we have. Start understanding it now. We didn't just arbitrarily pick April 15th and October 15th. Didn't say, wait, let's have taxes. I don't know. April 15th sounds good to me. Right? We didn't just say, you know, taxes, let's make them do April 15th. That sounds good. Okay, we had a reason for it. It's the end of the first quarter reporting. Okay, and it's the uh, end of the third quarter reporting is the extension date. See? We did have a method to our madness. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. All right. And by the way, Sheila, thank you. You were awesome. Though you were an awesome help today. 
All right. So go out there, Garrett. You are to go watch a movie tonight. And good luck. Oh, I just talked to Frank, and I'm scheduled to do mine on Saturday. Oh, you will kick butt. You will kick butt. Okay? You guys okay. are great. All right? So go relax. Go do whatever. I will talk to you guys again on Friday. And we'll be covering, covering the income statements and the balance sheets and that sort of thing, and we'll be going from there. I hope you guys Later. got something out of today. I hope you guys understand now a little more of the difference between between the